Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're joining us on a channel that you don't normally see us on, we are multi-streaming to a couple different locations today. So we invite you to hop over to the Office Hour or the Office Hours Global YouTube channel and subscribe there, or go to officehours.global to learn more. This is a show where we're here to answer your questions about media and digital production. So if you've got questions. Just throw those into Makana where you can also vote on other pr producers' questions and chat with the other producers. If you're not in Makana, you can also ask questions by just going to askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global, and it is open 24-7. Let's hop right into the questions. First one. Our first one this morning is from Grant Whitehead in Adelaide, Australia. And Grant wonders, what's the process to create VR 180 with audio head tracking? Is it possible, and how would Vision Pro play it? That's a good question, Grant. Um, I know uh, I would probably want to throw this one to Alex. He's coming in a little bit later, so we might want to throw this question in uh, for a little while longer because I don't want to give you a non-answer. But, Bill, you've got an idea. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say that it, it, it seems to me that that would be pretty disoriented. If you're talking about recording Vision Pro uh, and following an audio panning thing and then you were playing that for somebody else who was wearing a Vision Pro, wouldn't that kind of disorient them a bit? I mean, I think the Vision Pro head tracking um, – Mapping that to a recording would be very, it seems to me, would be very disorienting. I may not be understanding this correctly, the, the, but it, that's my thought. The, the head tracking, by the way, sorry about that. Um, the head tracking is uh, not something you have to worry about. <laughs> so, so when you're head tracking, uh, the, the head tracking is, is something that Apple does for you. So you're basically building a space in which all the audio exists inside of, whether that's Atmos or any other spatial, however Apple has it set, however you set that up. But you're building a space that has the, it has the audio in it, and then you are the Apple's tracking tracking where your head is inside of that. Think of a sphere. Think of the the audio being a sphere that your head's sitting inside of. You're figuring out where the audio is on that sphere. Apple's figuring out where your head is inside of that sphere, and so you don't have to do any head tracking to make the spatial work. And it is nice to have experts around. That's why having a wonderful panel like this is great. So let's get to the next question. Jeff Francis in Columbia, South Carolina, and here on the panel says, weird Dante problem. Some subscriptions missing because Dante device name changed from CL3 to CL5. Corrected name and subscriptions returned, but other subscriptions were unaffected. Thoughts? Go ahead, Nigel. Uh, Jeff should probably have gone first, but I'm having problems all over the place. So uh, subscriptions keep changing. My routing got forgot every day. I... I did the appropriate Googleization and I deinstalled controller off my machine. I've reinstalled Soundcard and it settled down. But but the, it, it appears in the latest versions there were some upgrades for for me at least for control and virtual soundcard. And it, it messed a whole bunch of things up somewhere. Jeff, what do you got going on? So this is a 10-year-old installation that has a CL3 in it. Um, and so the default names were the Yamaha names. So it's it's longer name in the Dante device than CL3, but it's like, you know, Y001-CL3-6 uh, letter alphanumeric code. Um, but the only thing that I changed about it, so I looked at the subscriptions that were missing and they were going between that CL3 and a Symmetrix uh, processor. And I could see that this the subscription that was missing is labeled there, and I saw that the name was different. So I went and changed the, looked at the name of the CL3 console, and in Dante it was a CL5, um, and I changed it back, and those subscriptions reappeared. But none of the other connections to the CL3, which went to a, a Rio, it went to some Sure Wireless, it went to um, a Dante Virtual Sound Card, all those other subscriptions were still intact, both before the name change and after the name change. Now, I looked on uh, Dante's FAQ, um, and there are cer certain versions of Dante firmware, the older versions, where the name change, it's supposed to follow, subscriptions follow the names of devices, so you're not supposed to change names or you have to re-institute new subscriptions. Um, and there was something with uh, old firmwares that not happening all the time. So I need to do some more diving in this, just wanted to see if anybody had any experience with that. I'm trying yeah, to I think, think that I think that we had um, uh, Mickey threw something into the chat where he said uh, that that is operating as expected. Dante subscriptions refer to device names and channel names to reinstate subscriptions. If Dante, if the Dante name is changed, the subscriptions 
created with the old Dante name will disappear after the next power cycle. Yeah, and I had power cycled. So I'm wondering why certain, I, I don't know if Yamaha like doesn't care that it has a CL3 or a CL5 because it still kept talking to the Rio. Uh, but I'll need to do some more digging on this one. And the big question is, why did the name change? And this was after, an, sorry, repeat, repeat it. This was after an update? No, it was not after an update. It just changed on its own? It just changed, yeah. Was working Wednesday and then Thursday was not. And anything else, had, did anything else change on the network? No. And no, and no devices were added? No. No, this is a locked classroom yeah. system. Wow. So has anyone done Symmetrics programming and does Symmetrics allow you to uh, configure Dante subscriptions? Um, does anyone know? I don't think we have anybody on the panel. I, that's, Symmetrics is pretty vertical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the... Uh, um, and Mickey asked, uh, are the CL to Rio subscriptions managed by the board or in the Dante controller? Uh, this is a toggle. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would have to look in the CL. I'll take Did a look at that and come back. Plugged and plugged back in. Could be. I mean, I mean as, as, in the part of the troubleshooting when there's no sound. Yep. You know, people are unplugging things and rebooting yeah. things. So I'm just wondering if it if if that's when it happened is when it reset. Uh, Mickey says that if it was managed by the CL, it will automatically resubscribe. Um, yeah, I'm maybe that's the it, clue. Is the CL was resubscribing even with the the different name, right? And the symmetrics could not. Yeah. Okay, I'll do some more diving. And then the person that, that we know that's not on the panel today is Brian Maddox. I would, I would ping Brian. He, he has some experience with symmetrics. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. And Douglas says, how do you protect your equipment against dust? I use the deck saver covers on every piece of equipment I can, but they don't have a cover for the Yamaha DM3 yet. And he's got a link there to the deck saver. Go ahead, Jason. Analog mixers were the reason you needed to protect against dust. Digital mixers really aren't affected in the same way. So, um, yeah, deck savers are cool, but buy your DM3, put it in the dustiest place you can imagine. I think you'll be fine. Courtney? Yeah, I use old pillowcases uh, for some mixers, uh, the, the right size for a, for a uh, DM3. Um, so just use an old pillowcase, throw over the top of it, and... Uh, Make sure nobody sets anything on top of it, you know. And then you can wash them when they get really dusty. Jeff? Douglas, you're worrying about way too much. That's my simplest thing. It's just enjoy the gear, use it. You'll get tired of it and sell it for something else soon. Alex? Uh, a lot of time, electronic, I, I tend to clean my gear a lot. <laughs> so I, I do worry about it, same thing. Um, is uh, uh, vac You can get little electronic vacuums. There's a whole ver wide variety of them that aren't, that are relatively gentle and you can just um, pass them over the top of it. It'll pull a lot of the stuff off of it. Uh, when talking on the phone, uh, on a meeting, oftentimes I will pull all the keys, pull all the, uh, all the pieces off and, and, then, and then kind of wipe around everything just with, with, with you know, some kind of, uh, you know, alcohol agent alcohol based agent to uh to kind of keep it keep it tidy um the other thing is is that if you're in a space that you use all the time like a studio uh you'd be surprised at how effective hepa filters are <laughs> so uh most of what's happening is airborne and, and if you're constantly cleaning the air uh it will um it'll keep a, the reason i do it is because i just am really sensitive to smells so i don't like so i just have it i like to have the the room cleaned all the time um, but I don't have it running when I'm doing anything with it. But I, when I'm not there, or, you know, I have it kind of clear the air. Um, and so uh, you might want to think about that as well. Jeff? Uh, these deck saver covers look like a pl clear plastic cover. I would be cautious to only use them when the gear is powered off because you don't want to contain all that heat in the gear. And Courtney? And if you don't put a dust cover on it and you want to clean it up, uh, I suggest these makeup uh, uh, foundation application brushes, which you can get from any, uh, you know, drugstore, makeup store. Uh, they're very soft bristle and they absorb dust very quickly. You just need to brush off and it gets in down in between all the knobs. Alex, wrap us up. 
And the, the thing that we worry about way more than dust is water. So if you're in a, in a space that has water, uh, if in a space that has uh, sprinklers, sprinkler systems worry us a lot. So a lot of times we have rolls of, of plastic that we will roll, you know, roll over it and kind of get to a point where it's kind of where it needs to be. And we, we used to leave it that way because we had one, it took us about a couple of years to recover from the fact that we had a sprinkler system go off. It didn't do that much damage, it just terrified us. <laughs> like it was, it, you know, it, it, we didn't hit very many things. It's just like, if that hit all the gear, we would be, that'd be the end of the company. So, uh, so anyway, so we were, we were a little, that, that's the thing we worry about more is water. All right, one more, Jeff. Okay, so there is that time. <laughs> we do it outdoor sports you kind of do worry about water also and uh even in, t in sometimes inside i remember one of the last years i did the trade show booth for new tech we got a call and they're like uh we need everybody to the you know all the tech people we need everybody to the booth to verify make sure everything's okay about three uh, this is like two days three days before where the show started about three rows over was I can't remember the actual company that was doused by it, but one of the water mains went off above the fire and uh, there was no fire, but it just, the valve burst and, and it drenched that whole booth. So can you imagine that, that much water coming through? I mean, it was literally running down the aisles at that. So in those situations, it is what it is, but on an every common, everyday thing, if you're outdoors, yeah, we protect it with tarps and, and other stuff like that. But every day in the studio, in a studio, filters, good filters, there's probably not a lot of dust unless you live in the desert and have that. Next question. Next one comes to some Guy Cochran in Seattle, and Guy says, any pre-NAB teasers or announcements yet? Bill? Uh, not for public consumption. You know, if you've been through the press pass process uh, a while back, you're starting to get a ton of announcements now, but often they are embargoed until a particular announcement date. So there is a lot of activity that is now spiking up on those back channels about what's going to be coming out at NAB. There will always be a lot of new things shown, but um, you find very quickly if you get into that world that if you start talking about them before the embargo falls, you don't get invited to have that information ahead of time. But it'll be there'll be a lot of new things announced at NAB. You can be sure of that. Alex, we also we are already saw a pretty aggressive uh, release by Black Magic for their cameras. So we talked about that yesterday, but um, there's a lot of. Uh, that was probably the most aggressive. It's, it's considered a beta, I think, because they changed so many things so quickly. Um, so, but I think that we we should expect over the next two weeks, Black Magic has moved away from uh, releasing things all at NAB and that two hour long press uh, event um, and have gotten into more of a, like releasing everything for the couple of weeks. So the next two weeks, we should see a lot of announcements from a lot of different companies, but Black Magic being one of them. And just a reminder for some listeners who might not be around here often, uh, we are going to be at NAB with a booth uh, broadcasting uh, throughout the conference and then also still doing our regular morning show with a lot of Q&A. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, to interact with NAB if you can't get there via office hours. Next question. Burkhead Friedrich in Isenberg, Germany, says rendering of a music video, Final Cut Pro project, with uh, it looks like M Roto AI plugin. The footage takes up all the system memory in my Sonoma M1 Mac Mini, 16 gigabytes, 133 gigabytes is used. How can I calculate before where my hardware limits are? Alex? It's almost impossible. Sorry, <laughs> like I, I would love to tell you that because as you go into each plugin, you're not going to, you know, it's not clear what you're doing and each plugin is going to, how you use it is going to change. So, um, you know, there are, you know, MRoto, you know, any, MRoto AI is going to use a lot because it's got to, it's got to make a lot of decisions. Now what you can do is flatten that. So you get the Roto out and then you start to flatten all those, all the things that you're doing. The reason it's taking up so much memory right now is that it's all live, it's all dynamic. So rendering out some of that stuff and using it then, and then bringing it back in will release some of that but there's no way for this is the problem with doing for instance live on with software is that uh, you can ask the computer you can keep on adding things to a computer and it's going to keep on adding them whether it has the resources or not so um, so anyway so I think that uh, you should um, uh, that you you're not going to know 16 gigs for if I'm going to do heavy final cut work I probably wouldn't consider a 16 gig I, you know I can't calculate it for you but I would say 64 is you know, if you're going to, if you're going to, I'm going to do more than just cut, edit things. Um, I would be considering 64 gigs or more uh, for a final cut system. 
Bill? I agree 100 percent with Alex about that. Also, plugins, you know, we think of plugins as they're all the same, but they're really not. The code behind the plugin can be efficient or inefficient. And I'm not trying to slam uh, Mr. Roto or M. Roto AI at all. This is just universally true of all subroutines and programs written. Some are efficient and some are less efficient. Some try to do heavy lifting of something. If this is trying to do an AI integration in real time in there, it just may need a lot of horsepower to get it done. And I agree absolutely with Alex. I wouldn't go with the low end um, memory buffer on board if you're going to be doing complicated work like music video production. Next question. Next one comes from Tlaloc Lopez Waterman in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Jeff, one F. Jeff, would you mind turning your LED wall black? Curious to see your lighting. Jeff, it's demo time. LED wall, this is my office. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. There. So that's bars. bars. I love the boarded up window. I like that one too. All right, let's see if we can get this off now. All right, there it is. So two key lights basically here and here, and uh, they're all soft boxes. Uh, I, I have a really low ceiling in here, so uh, that's like seven foot, seven foot, two inches, something like that. And uh, the... Uh, I don't have enough space above the board in the back to put a, a fill light in the back. but uh, That's cool. Your key lights are kind of reflecting off your background, but because it's not a key, it's not damaging at all yeah, because be, it's well, an active because, source. You know, they're, they're going, you're, you're getting light off of this. And, and just so you, let me go back to where I was at. 30, 31% is what my uh, brightness is, but this is an outdoor. So, yeah. I, I'll t- oh, I'll it's an outdoor you. LED wall? Yeah, this is outdoor. I'll show you how bright it gets. How's that? Oh, boy. Watch out. She gets, Shade your eyes. She gets bright. Yeah. You get a suntan so on the back. That's of you. at 100% there. So, yeah, I, I would. And uh, my LEDs that are in here, these uh, NAND lights are uh, like one of them is 50%. The other one's 35 or something like that. So they're not very bright. I don't really need that much light. I, I kind of open up my iris a little bit more, but that's back down to 30% there. So it looks a little bit more realistic but th- it's, it's good, a good looking picture it's nicely balanced for yeah this so. this actual this uh, scene that i have from uh, uh from unreal uh marketplace is um it, it's more cartoony it's it's not as uh realistic as some of the architectural stuff yeah, and so it has like a little softness to it so it doesn't actually look as uh sharp uh, but in real life it looks looks good but not as sharp as some of the architectural that looks like the real thing a peek at the man behind the curtain. Thanks for the behind the scenes. Next question. Chris Fenwick, Emeryville, California, here on the panel up next. Lively discussion in the pre-show. Let's do a day when we're all prepared to show our favorite uses of stream decks. Also, maybe we could suggest some out-of-the-box uses right now. We've got a good number of people raise their hands. Go ahead, Nigel. So my favorite use is when I do an ecam show. I have every scene I want as a button. And it's on a 16 so I can pretty much know exactly where I'm going and jump from, you know, one shot to two shot to three shot and change it. And I, and I can pretty much mix the show just by pressing that because of the connection with Ecamm. My biggest problem is I do have a Stream Deck Plus and Jason had something, but I can't find a use of the dials. I, I think that was a, a purchase mistake. Jeff? I'll be in Austin this weekend. Uh, Nigel, take that Stream Deck Plus off of you. Uh, it's not a problem. <laughs> because I did find a use for the dials. I'm actually running a uh, Yamaha CL1 with it and uh, couldn't believe that we were able to make it work like that. Um, just some adjustments here and there. Uh, but you tap the knob and you have a mute. You spin the knob up or down. You can increase, decrease the uh, faders. Uh, so that's that was one of the things this week that uh, we've kind of broke through with. Uh, other than that, uh, linking up to QLab to run uh, audio bits and, and bytes whenever we need to do intro music or applause tracks or or the good old wah, wah, wah horn that we have, that we love to run with. So yeah, that is just uh, like a shot box, more or less, is, is our favorite use for it. Jason? I took the time to um, buy and then install the here to record presets you know the the super source presets stuff like this for um for for multi-cam use and uh you can 
absolutely program those in as a macro and then set the macro with the stream deck. And that's a pretty good use. Uh, Samuel? Yeah, my, my main use for, with the stream deck is uh, using it with companion. And there's a whole bunch of integrations that you can use, but probably my one of my favorite ones is the Vicuro listener. You can trigger uh, keyboard shortcuts, and then you have the OSC module and the HTTP module, so you can control all kinds of uh, things that use HTTP and OSC over the network. Alex? I have to admit that mine are not out of the box, but I, the way I use it is um, the, the, one that, the one that I use the most. Uh, I have to turn this off somewhere. Anyway, so the um, is my with my drawing app. I have all of the colors, presets, everything else on 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 a Excel that's here, and then I have another one over here that is that I use for this one is just for my PowerPoint pre not PowerPoint but keynote presentations, and it just has my my navigation. That way, I don't need to have the keyboard open. I have a lot of keep I have a lot of computers that are running things, so the computer that does presentation is only presentation. So once it goes into the deck, all I need is that little that little uh, stream deck to run it. Um, and that way I can um, have my keyboard, you know, be somewhere else. Um, and then the uh, then the other Stream Deck that I, well, I'm now starting to work with the Stream Deck software on the on my iPads, although I've had a little trouble getting them to do the handshake correctly. And that just gives you a lot more buttons and, and they're a little bit more configurable. I realized that what I really want Stream Deck to do is on the, I, on the iOS versions is to get rid of the grid. Um, I, I have to admit that I've shown what Mimo, Mimo does, I think, in the past, is with Mimo, I can build a really complicated grid and I can make the buttons any size I want and give them space between them and put them in groups and everything else. And now that I've gotten used to doing that, I, I find uh, <laughs> for, for, for kind of the kind of shows, you know, for a show that you do every day that needs to look the same, um, I find the kind of the hard grid is a little bit intolerable, you know, and so it's just, you know, so I, th I feel like, you know, I don't, I can make, I need certain buttons to be bigger, certain ones to be smaller. I want to be able to group them and move them around. And um, so I'm starting to use, uh, starting to learn universe um, so that I can build those buttons. <laughs> so, so that I can, I can um, make the interface look the way I want it to look as opposed to uh, like, I realize we've been conforming to the interface artificially and I'd rather build the interface and just have it tie in. If Stream Deck just let us, just took the grid off of the iOS version and just let us just draw buttons where we wanted to on the screen, it'd be pretty awesome. You know, like, and people would probably, the only problem is that people would probably stop buying their hardware. They just start buying iPads and, and designing what they wanted it to look like. Chris? I personally would, <clears throat> would never use an iPad because I want to feel the button underneath my finger. And intolerable, Alex? Really? Intolerable. 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 Night, Here's the funny thing is, difficult. I find the iPad more responsive. I find looking down and clicking on it and having it blink, I find that to be more, I'm more sure that the button's going to go through with that than I am with the, the, uh, the Stream Deck hardware. Okay. So, that's... So, so in terms of like programming a, sh a day of this, I think, it would, I think one goal is that we would... Um, First rule, you can't you can't even mention companion until like the second half of the hour. So it's like really basic, <laughs> like you know, like Stream Deck for Dummies is like the first 20 minutes, like how you know how the different bits of software interact with it, how you go and find the appropriate plugin that you need to give it added extensibility, and then you know, get into all that. I it's such a powerful tool. And then not only just what we are doing with it, but like you could even do five minutes on how you organize your pages and the logic behind it and stuff, because it, it sort of gets your mind thinking like, oh yeah, maybe that shouldn't be a whole, it doesn't, I, maybe I don't need a whole nother device. Maybe I could do a page when I get into now I'm doing presentations or whatever. But anyway, I think it's a, a really interesting thing. And, and I know that there are many people, good friends of mine who are like, uh, I don't really know how to deal with that thing. So I think it'd be, you know, Stream Deck for Dummies. Jeff? I agree, Chris. They, they're, so, they're so useful. It's universal. Uh, Alex, if if you need the different sizes, I would suggest also looking into uh, a larger X keys because you could change out the buttons in those from their smaller one-by-one -one buttons to like a two-by-two -two or even a one-by-twos. And I mean, that's what I have to do because I wanted just a big button to hit for breaks or something like that or replays, whatever. Uh, but the other is on uh, the vector, which I know we're starting to play with around here a little more. 
uh, the live panel, you can actually change the buttons and change shapes of the buttons, which I kind of like too, and space out things, uh, which is like similar to what you're saying is just something that's a web-based uh, touch panel control type yeah. stuff. And the ROS, the ROS designing tools are also another thing that I'm, you know, fiddling with a little bit um, because they you can build the interfaces that you'd like. But I think that there's a there's going to be a growing future of people realizing they could just build screens the way they want them to, to be built and not have to not have to be, you know, constrained to a grid. For me, it's you don't have somebody messing up the software itself. It, you only give them mm -hmm. the tools that they can access or they need access. Yeah. And I don't want them monkeying around with the GUI itself. Well, and, and again, I, I like the idea that what I like right now is the idea that I have all that interface open if I need to fix something, but I can, but I, you know, I have it available to me. And, but I, you know, like for instance, for, I really have been thinking about, I love Mix Effect Pro, but if, if there was an interface, for Mix Effect Pro that was like Mimo Live that I could design what I wanted to do and then be able to just click on it. Now, if I need to flip to another window that says, hey, I got to fix that super source, I can still do that um, on the fly. But mo for the most part, you know, for a lot of shows, not all shows, I mean, people, you know, you want to respond to whatever's happening in the show and that's that's important. But for 95% of the shows out there, they work pretty much the same every day. <laughs> you know? And so and so being able to build, and like that's what we have for this show is there's an interface that abstracts all of the complexity of the switcher to where there's a, you know, it's built in universe. It talks to Isadora. It does, and there's a lot of the, a lot of the complex, complexities of this show are abstracted away from the user and they simply have a page that they can open on the web to run the show. And that's what I think is, is I think really could be transformational if, if more people did it. We'll see. Next question. John Prado, whom we miss here on the panel in Las Vegas, Nevada. Adobe Summit it was this week. I thought I was watching a Salesforce.com conference. Their primary focus was AI, but centered around enterprise systems and very little in the way of new tools for creatives. A bit disappointing. Thoughts? Courtney. Well, you know, Adobe, we all got involved with Adobe you know, when they came out with Photoshop and, and uh, After Effects and uh, Premiere. Uh, but, uh, what a lot of us didn't realize, in fact, I worked on some commercials. I got a call to work commercial. So I was Adobe commercial. I was like, oh, great. Maybe I can get some free, uh, software. And it turned out to be, uh, there's a division of Adobe called Adobe marketing. And now they've renamed it Adobe experience cloud. That's all, uh, tools for marketing your products, business to business or business to customer. And, um, AI, since AI is very uh, data centric, uh, I'm thinking maybe you got in on the part, you know, you know if you look at their at their website, uh, the Adobe Experience Cloud that does end to end digital marketing, marketing cloud products, campaign execution, content management, those kind of tools that are kind of far and away different from what uh, those of us down in the trenches uh, get involved with. It's all about digital marketing. Alex. Yeah, I believe there's a, there, I can't name, think of the name of it at the moment, but the, there's a second Adobe um, event in the fall that is much more creator based. So they have lots of creatives that will come in and, and uh, discuss it. So they, there's a, a TikTok there that, that the, this one is designed for enterprise and the fall version is designed for creators and they bring in actors and they, they spend all the money on it. Uh, the other thing is, is that this is where a, a big part of their subscriptions come from and, and a big part of their revenue um, coming from the ad, the ad based, as Courtney said, you know, ad, ad processes um, is a big part of what Adobe does. Um, and, uh, and finally, you know, <laughs> they have to pay, pay a lot of attention. This was all fun and games until Canva bought um, Serif <laughs> because now the whole uh, creative process is going to suddenly become much bigger. It was, I think when, when Affinity was a tiny little company doing what it was doing, um, it wasn't that big of a deal, but now Adobe's actually going to have to pay attention to their, their Photoshop and, and, uh, other products because they now have a much, much larger company that's going to start pushing that down the field and make and widening that market. Coming up at the top of the hour, we've got a tour with Tenacious Ventures out of Seattle, Washington, uh, Colin Christensen, the founder and CEO with Chris Hunter, their EIC is there with our own Guy Cochran. So we're really looking forward to a behind the scenes studio tour to see how they're uh, dealing with live events and uh, streaming online. It's, it looks like a really impressive studio. So stick around. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next and Douglas asks, what would be the most flexible platform for creating immersive experiences based on digital audio workstation created music? Basically, synchronizing multiple production elements to a time code lock timeline on Mac OS. Go ahead, Alex. 
It really depends. Like, you, is it a is it a Mac or a PC? Is it is it something that you know? What kind of features do you need? QLab would probably be the first thing that we would probably look at as far as firing those off. It doesn't really matter. I mean, DAW based music, but it's just it's just firing off commands at a certain time code. So it's got a time code going by, um, and it's making decisions about that. So QLab might be one of the others on a PC side. You might want to think about Ventus. Uh, Ventus, you'll see at NEB, we'll probably cover them a little bit, but they. That's where you see they build all kinds of very powerful interfaces. And we shouldn't uh, ignore that you could probably build many, many of these things inside of Unreal Engine at this point. So uh, with Unreal Engine, you could be building all the, uh, it has all the I.O. that you need to do, um, both the, the, the time code coming in as well as the commands going out. And it can generate the environments and a lot of the other things that you would need. Uh, you know, and it's free until you make a million dollars. <laughs> so, so it's a, and then it starts costing money. So, uh, so it is a, a, you also want to take a look at that as well. Next question. Zach Jeffers in the great Pacific Northwest it has a QR code question that came in. I'm looking for suggestions on educational materials and or videos that will explain all the various transport streams, manifest structures, and so forth in macro and detail, and possibly some tools to work with them while testing and developing workflows and systems. Alex? Yeah, the I don't know if there's that much on the web. There's a book by Andy Beach, uh, and I believe it's called, the, I can't remember, it's the Streaming Handbook. I, I, you know, but but Andy Beach works at Microsoft, and he he's part of the Azure infrastructure. But he worked at Elemental. He worked at, at uh, um, uh, a variety of other. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the other company, but but the uh, a, a variety of other companies that have all worked on streaming. He's probably one of the world experts. I mean, he is the one of the world experts in live streaming. And he wrote a book uh, quite some time ago about um, about live streaming. I just can't think of the name of it right now, um, but about streaming. But I would start with that book. You know, like, you know, he's the best person. He's the person that when I can't figure something out, Colleen Henry and Andy Beach are the two people that I usually end up talking to about it. <laughs> so so, um, so I would I would highly recommend his book. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas is up next. Wise just came out with its best security camera ever. What other uses in production could it be used for? And he's got a link there. Samuel? Well, I don't think you would want to use it for anything in production except uh, security, uh, uh, watching over your equipment or whatever. You see it's uh, this here... Uh, it's a, a fisheye lens on here, so it's really made for se, uh, for security camera, and it's also uh, wireless. So uh, I wouldn't use it for anything that was important. Courtney, yeah, I agree with Samuel. I, I have a Wise uh, camera at my doorbell, and they work quite well. They're wide angle. They report to the cloud. They record locally. But for security, I would never uh, try and put the output of one uh, on the air somewhere. Uh, they're very wide angle. And uh, and very sometimes very slow frame rate. Next question. Clive Lundford in Kingston, Jamaica. Up next, Alex has been showing bits and pieces of the mobile setup for NAB. Any further updates? Would you consider the new Axun SEMA 4K with a mirrorless camera and a wireless microphone as a backup for NAB production? And he's got a link there to YouTube. Alex? I don't think that we, this is the, the rig right now. I, I am going to make a video about it, so we'll see. But this is the rig. This is the iPhone rig that I have at the moment that fully for, formed. I can take pieces off of it if I don't need them. So there's the, the screen and the ambisonic mic on the top is still testing. Um, but the rest of it is pretty well, pretty straightforward. And uh, it is, um, it's really just a test rig. We're not going to use it in broadcast. <laughs> like it's, it's just for me to play with. Uh, we have uh, some really great transmitters and, uh, um, we, uh, uh, we have some great transmitters, um, and we have great cameras that we're planning to use for the, um, for the show for, from Sony. Uh, and I don't think we would probably try to tie an iPhone into the middle of all of that. So, um, so, and we have live views that both Jeff is bringing and, and that, that, that live view is lending us as well. So we've got a lot of, I mean, I, I think we kind of have the backups to the backups right now, as far as lots of different ways of getting that signal out. And, um, those will be the ones we primarily focus on. The envy grows in all of our hearts. <laughs> Next question. Next one comes to us from Tommy Shantz in St. Paul, Minnesota. And Tommy says, what computer specs do folks use for their dedicated presentation decks? Go ahead, Courtney. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jason. I use the cheapest um, M1 Mac Mini, the, the last one that's kind of at the bottom of the stack in my rig. And the, the caveat here is that that's, that's kind of all I use it for. So, like, the, you know, emphasis on the word dedicated. Alex? 
Yeah, I have an M1 Mac Mini um, with eight gigs of RAM, and it seems to do fine with Keynote. <laughs> so, so it 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 plays back whatever it needs to. It's not a very expensive. It's it's and really is just an application. It's an appliance. You know, like it, it. That's all it does is is that one thing for presentations. Um, and I would say that uh, you know, unless the company is very very tied into Windows and everything else. Most of the time when almost every company that does a major presentation and is using some kind of deck is using Keynote. And even if they, kn even if they don't know it, because we, we say, hey, can we uh, conform your, uh, us asking you to conform your deck, can we conform your deck for broadcast? And they say, yes, that means we're taking your PowerPoint, putting it into Keynote and fixing it. You know, and so um, like, and that's what happens in a, a lot of events, you know, and so we had to stop doing it for some companies because they make their own version. But before that, it was still all Keynote. <laughs> so, um, uh, so it, so Keynote is the kind of the, um, the main uh, used in events. Uh, PowerPoint is the main one used in small, you know, meetings and conference rooms. Um, but, but Keynote is definitely the one that most people use when you see a very large event. Um, they'll use it, they'll use that to, to make it work. So it's just really um, uh, the smallest Mac mini you can find is usually enough. And Courtney? Well, if it's with the corporate world or just for me for doing television shows, for doing playback, I use the uh, uh, Melee Quieter 2 or Quieter 3, uh, Quieter 4 now. Uh, they're tiny. You can get uh, four of them for the price of a single Mac Mini. 16. They're 16 gigabytes. So they have plenty of RAM. You can put a terabyte uh, uh, NVMe drive in there, and it uh, will power uh, three video monitors simultaneously. You can put different uh, playbacks on the three different monitors, and I wrote my own software. So uh, my own software works very cleanly, with, and it's designed for doing presentation work, and it has all the tools built in to quickly trigger and network them together so I can trigger multiple ones at the same time. And like I say, 200 bucks, you can't beat it. Next question. Talalak Lopez Waterman in Santa Fe, New Mexico says, Jeff Francis, you mentioned using your iPad for reading music. What program do you use? Does it bother, bother you if someone inverts the music, white notes on black background, he selfishly asks as the lighting designer? Jeff. So I was a staunch uh, paper music uh, score reader. Uh, I use I'm not playing music usually. I'm either taking notes on it or I'm reading notes on it for uh, camera cues and that kind of thing. And most people that perform music off of this use a uh, software uh, iPad app called Four Score, F O R Score. Um, I had when I purchased an iPad from way back, I had a thing called PIA Score, P I A Score. So that's what I use. And uh, you can see a score there that's marked up. Um, this is just a piano quartet, but also I'll look at uh, large uh, orchestra scores on here. And uh, it gets a little bit small looking at a landscape um, with two pages on there, but it uh, certainly helps when there's 400 pages in uh, one concert. Um, and do I ever do this? No, I would never run score that way. Uh, I've, I've never tried that until today. So uh, maybe I could learn to look at that. But uh, that hurts my brain. So, no, I would always just run with very low, uh, very dim screen. Next question. Next one comes from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul says, Bastrop, Texas Film Studio was removed from city regulation under state law. Will this hasten the exodus of the film industry from California and so forth to Texas? And there's a link there. Jason? <laughs> Uh, no, course and scope. Studios take a long time to build. So, um, yeah, no. Jeff? As a fellow Texan, Paul, I'm going to be honest with you. And no offense to any of our friends around here from California. We don't want them here. So don't make it easier. Okay. We're just going to let them stay over there and they can do their little movie TV show thingy. All right. We've, we've got enough. We've got enough space. You're okay. Chris? Um, I, I will say this when I did my, my road trip through Texas a couple of years ago, Bass Trip was my favorite part that I saw. I didn't see it all, but of the places I looked at, um, it's an interesting thought. I don't know. I, I, I don't know that everybody feels that way, Jeff. I think a lot of Texans do, but it would be, it, it might be good for business. Let's just and put it Alex. that way. 
Yeah, I think that the, the the main thing is California's got a lot of challenges and they're and they're still giving away more money than Texas. Texas, I think, is increasing this to two hundred million dollars a year. California gives about three hundred and thirty million dollars a year away. Uh, California's been trying to kind of make this work out. The um, you know, the the folks that have been the best at it, the states New Mexico is the the, the the state that got the ahead of it in front of everybody else, and they now have massive studios in in uh, in Albuquerque and a couple other locations. Uh, because of that, um, you also have Georgia and Louisiana are two heavy, uh, and then Canada, and then there's others. There's other states, but those are the big ones. Those and they've been around the longest, and they've really shown uh, if you stick with it. The real problem the states have is they'll start this program, and then you know some uh, you know book smart. Uh, legislator will say, well, we're not making enough money at this. Let's quit. As soon as you quit, you've reset it, but you've done worse because now no one trusts you. Like no one can build a plan after that. <laughs> so you're better off not doing it unless you're going to do it for two decades. Um, and because again, Georgia, Louisiana, and, and New Mexico have been really, have proven to be really useful in that area. I think that Texas could be very competitive. Um, you know, it, you know, the, um, the, what they call runaway productions, have keep on increasing. And right now, I've just been reading article after article about how many have left the state of California. And it has to do with, uh, you know, the the incentives are part of it. Um, just general cost of production is another part of it. And uh, a growing number of producers that just don't like working in California. <laughs> like so, so that, you know, there, there's a lot of regulations here that don't exist in other states. Um, and they've just decided they don't want to do it anymore. And so and I think it's now 60 or 70% of productions are not, no longer in California. Which, which is interesting because New York is still thriving, you know, which does, it has many of the same regulations. And so it's a fascinating thing that New York is, you know, and I think it's mostly around New York City. And it probably has to do with the city itself um, is just as far as uh, picturesque and, you know, dense and you need to have it look a certain way. Uh, but the but I think that the golden age for California is probably over um, in that area. And, you know, it's all running away and the market's getting smaller all at the same time. <laughs> so it's not just that it's running, the, 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 the productions are running away. It's there's just less of them. Um, and we probably re, we, we probably reached peak production uh, three or four years ago and we'll probably never see the kind of production we saw at the beginning of the streaming launch um, for many, many reasons. It could probably be a whole second hour. Courtney. Uh, well, I wouldn't hold my breath there, Paul, because I can count being a Texan, being born in Texas and living in San Antonio and Austin for many years. There have been so many uh, film studio projects that have come and gone in Texas. There was the the one uh, North Dallas Studios. Remember those that went in in the 70s? Uh, they died away. Kalinga uh, uh, Studios, I think. Then there was one plan for East Austin. A bunch of sound stages. They were taking over a bunch of land. That was about five years, five or six years ago. And that never came to fruition. Now there's this one in Bastrop. Maybe it'll come about. Texas does have some of the highest property uh, uh, taxes on earth. I know having to pay them every year. Uh, so there's that to consider. Whether or not uh, uh, they will uproot a lot of production, move there. Most of this runaway production that Alex was talking about is theatrical production for small to mid-sized theatrical films because they're going for those incentives where they can pocket a lot of that money that comes from those individual states like Louisiana and, and uh, Georgia. Um, whether or not uh, Texas uh, is going to pony up <clears throat> a bunch of money and tax money, uh, the taxpayers don't like those programs, even though they bring a lot of supposed uh, money into the state. We'll see if they follow through on it. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how well it is. Television production has stayed primarily in Los Angeles and New York. Uh, Universal just built eight brand new giant sound stages uh, on their back lot. So uh, I don't think it's going anywhere. And now one more gentleman from Texas, Mr. Nigel DeSalle. I learned early on there are two ways to leave Texas. One, you cross the border. The other, you go live in Austin. So I think you need to understand this difference between Texas and Austin. And so whether some of the business is coming to Austin versus Texas, it's a complicated picture. Uh, by the way, I ran into a production of Walking Dead the other day, a few a few months ago. I, I don't mean I was on 6th Street. I just mean they were filming it. Um, I actually think a more interesting challenge for them is uh, Vegas. So I th I think what Wahlberg's doing 
it's pulling some of the business that feels like you can you can live halfway between. And if they put the high speed train in, I think that might encourage that. So I think Vegas is going to be a much more interesting option for for the people who are trying to shift slightly, uh, no pun intended, right out of California. Jeff. Okay, I totally got the Sixth Street reference. Uh, having spent a few hours, <laughs> days, weeks, nights on that. Uh, I agree. I agree with what you were saying, Alex. Uh, I think that there is, and this is me being more honest and, and straightforward, uh, not just the typical Texan uh, bravado. Uh, there, there is reasons for them to come, but I also agree with Nigel. Is like Austin, where my brother lives, right outside of Austin. So we really experienced the growth out there. The amount of Californians that are coming in and moving in weekly is just amazing. I. I it's a scary amazing but a lot of those are coming from the tech side it's not movies and not show stuff it's really tech more than anything but no it, it's happening the great migration has already started alex uh, and, and two things one is is that the great migration has been happening for a long time when i went when i was in colorado you, there's bumper stickers that said californians go home so you know the the great migration has been happening for 30 or 40 years people come here they, you know, you build up, you get, you start getting a, a California salary, you build up a California savings account and with a California house, and then you can move anywhere. So, so that's, that's part of why I think people eventually, um, you know, emigrate from California, but there's still some opportunity here. Um, the, uh, the other thing I would pay attention to that's probably under the radar is, and I can't get into too many of the details of it, but Reno, Nevada, Reno, Nevada is going to be really interesting. Just keep your eye on that one. Next question. Next one comes to us from Jeff Francis and Jeff says, in uh, ISO, a replacement in search of a replacement mid-range driver for an EAW MS-103 speaker. EAW, part number, and he's got it there. EAW says no longer available, none in back stock, no recone kits available. Anyone have any new old stock lying around recommended or a recommended recone service for his speaker? Jeff? Jeff, I'll, I'll reach out to one of my local uh, resellers here. Uh, they're old friends of mine and see if they have them. That, that MS-103 is a sweet speaker. Man, I, that is one of my favorites to use for uh, booth monitors. That was that was a really great speaker. But I, I agree with you. I have some JBLs I can't get parts for anymore. And uh, it just it pains me to take them out of service because everything but that one tweeter <laughs> one tweeter everything but that is uh fully operational and they sound phenomenal but uh up except to that point where i can't hear that highs on that one side but uh yeah i'll uh i reach out to me directly on discord and i'll see what i can find at my local guy he, they're pretty resourceful next question Burkhard Friedrich in Isaberg, Germany is back with this one. When it's done, color grading of the raw footage, or when is it? When is it done? Color grading of the raw footage or for the final edit of a film project? Chris? It's done when you have the check. That's what I would say. <laughs> Bill? <laughs> I will say one thing. It's it's done when the producer says it's done. I mean, they usually give you a deadline and say the project has to ship on this date, and you work every bit of that and sometimes try to get more time, but that's when it's finally done. You're right, in term, Chris, in terms of the fact that you, you're really done when you get paid and the check clears, but before that, this is not controlled by anything other than the person who's in charge of the project. Alex? You saw the re-releases of Star Wars. It's never done. <laughs> so it, it can, it can, there's director's cuts. There's re-releases. Uh, it's you know it's it's done. It's it's done when nobody's watching it anymore. But it can it can continue continue to evolve. Uh, but we used to say in production that it's never no project is ever done. You just run out of time. Chris, I did a video for a certain Bavarian car company several years ago, and the morning of the event that the video was playing. The morning of the event, I made three changes to it. Not three, change these three things, but three complete revisions and passes and re-upload it and sent it back east to where it was playing the morning of the event. So uh, once it hits the sheets, it's it's usually done. But Alex? Yeah. Uh I've seen situations where half of the prints of a film have already been uh, printed, 
when they're making a, a, a change to it, like, uh, you know, <clears throat> greed of firing first. So, um, so the, the, uh, but, but those things, you know, half the prints were one way and half the prints were the other for a little while. Courtney. Well, there's three stages of color grading. One is, is for uh, dailies, you know, for the first edit to go to so that they can edit with something that's color corrected to just a standard like Rec 709 or a standard uh, color grade that they've chosen for the look of that picture. So a uh, final scene to scene color grading is uh, done right before, uh, you know, after the final mix and ready and when they're ready to output their first DCI or first answer prints. Uh, and then, of course, it will change depending upon the number of uh, 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 products that they're going to be feeding, television, uh, streaming, uh, theatrical distribution, uh, digital distribution, film output, et cetera, et cetera. So that's different grades for each of the outputs. But scene to scene is all done before the first DCI. Next question. This is interesting. Andy Kokendorf for Vieira, Florida. When prompting in mid-journey, how do you keep objects right and or left justified for Zoom background use? Thanks. Alex? Uh, you can you can actually say it in the prompt, but the other thing that you can do is once you've rendered it out of Mid Journey, you have a you have little arrows that you can point one left or right. So basically, you 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 will run Mid Journey. You'll get your four options. You'll then render one of them at either uh, high variance or low variance, you know, creative or 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 standard or whatever. And then you'll get you'll get that image out, and then a whole bunch of options zooming back out by two x, one point five x, custom x. But also you have arrows to render to the one side or the other. And so then what you can do is is just say I want to render that way. And what it'll do is it'll take the exact image that you have, it'll move it over and add more to it based on that. And it'll give you four options because some of them may not work. Um, and then what you can do is start to do things like you can circle you can circle an area and do a little bit of generative fill the same way you would see in Photoshop. So if you you know it might add a car when it sw swings over, um, and uh, so you can say, get rid of that car, <laughs> you know. And so so you can have it like refigure those things out. But that's how you would um, that's how you can extend it inside of Midjourney. I wouldn't worry as much about the prompt, and I'd use that reframing that comes after you render it. Next question. Tlaloc Lopez Waterman, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Did anyone learn about the impact to your YouTube channel when a high number of people watch in high speed? Do recommendations fall? And if monetized, do you earn less for less view time? Alex? So I did reach out to someone that would know. And, um, and, the, and the response was is that your time spent watching is time spent watching, period. It doesn't matter what speed it is. So if you watch it fast or slow, it's going uh, to measure it as the amount of time that you as the viewer actually watched. As far as monetization goes, um, it, it could theoretically affect your, um, uh, your income that came in from like creator payments and so on and so forth. But as far as ads, I mean, usually you're doing, you're, it's really a CTR issue, a click-through rate. Um, the, uh, your, the, you know, the display ads that might come somewhere in the middle and the end or, or, or at the, at the beginning, those are things that are driving your revenue, not so much. Now it might have effect also it, it, when you see number, number of amount of time, um, watched, it'll be lower, but I don't think that has a huge impact on it. The best way to keep that from happening is to put enough, create enough content density that people don't want to go fast. I realize that there are definitely channels in which I watch at 2x and there's channels that I watch at 1x and, I, and I've and i been paying attention to like which ones I, and the, and the bottom line is, is that the 1x channels are, it's too much content for me to watch at 2x. Like it's just, and so there's a content density problem for me as a viewer. Um, and so I realized that the, my habit of getting into 2x is because the content density is too low. And so I'm increasing that to increase the t content density. But if people add a lot of animation, they add a lot of other bits and pieces I can't keep up, you know, and so I have to slow back down again. And so I think that that's the thing to think about if you want to keep people at 1x is to give them enough content at 1x that, that they stay there. Chris? Wow, the questions. So first of all, Alex, do you know, if I hit the the forward arrow 12 times to get past an AG1 ad, do they get still get paid for that? Do you know? <laughs> I don't know. Also, don't know. also the, 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 as you know, uh, I'm not a fan of watching things at faster than normal speed. I find it intolerable, to borrow your word. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm totally curious, what, what uh, channels do you find that you need to watch at 1x? This is an interesting. Um, there are. I, I don't know if I can think of the channels off the top of my head. 
Um, I know that the one the one X ones generally have a lot of animation that's connected to the content, and that's you know, or they're experiential. So I will admit that my my uh, my guilty pleasure at the end of a day when we finish whatever we're watching as a family, we usually see if there's a new daily dose. And we don't want, we don't play that at 2x it's because it's just really fun. It's it's completely useless content on the internet, um, but usually uh, an enjoyable three and a half minutes of, of videos that were collect, you know, collected or whatever. And I, I know I'm not the only one because they have 17, he has 17 million subscribers. <laughs> and so, um, uh, so I watched that at 1x. So experiential stuff, I watched Nate Bargatze at 1x because it's funny. You have to, the, 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 the thing will, will be there. Um, I watch anything with a lot of, I watch a lot of, uh, for whatever reason, um, a lot of battlefield tactic videos. And and so those <laughs> ones are hard for me to get to do really fast. <laughs> like when you're watching the Battle of Hastings, uh, you know, it's it's hard to grok what's happening if you watch it at 2x, I find. So, um, and so there's a lot of really good ones, by the way. Um, anyway, so uh, so those are the kind of things that, that I watch at 1x. And then people, explainers of telling me about something about a new mixer or something like that or a new camera, that's at like 1.75 or two. Like the, the people talk way too much. Uh, that's what I'm thinking about doing a video about this iPhone thing and I'm this iPhone rig and I'm like, how do I not make it a 2x video? How do I make it a 1x video? And I haven't, I'm thinking hard about that. So what you need to do is you need to generate a badge and it's, and it's an award that you give out maybe daily. The 1x. And, it, and it's called the Alex Lindsay 1x award yeah. and with a nice little graphic and you can tweet a link to say, congratulations, you made a video that I had to watch Dense at enough. 1x. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Bill? I just find this fascinating because I was actually out yesterday and I was walking as I normally do and listening to an audio book and I found myself stopping and downshifting the audio book. Normally I list it at 1.25 to 1.4 sometimes, uh, but it was so well written and the performance was so good that I realized I needed to stop and slow it down to really steep myself in what the work of these people who had put a lot of time and effort into that. So I'm absolutely on Alex's side of this. If the work really reaches you, I want to I want to enjoy it and slow down. If I'm just listening, listening, I just want to, you know, get my pace up. And because I'm not exercising, that's what I want to do. It's really fascinating that the content for me drives the speed I want to consume the content at. Alex? Rory Sutherland, 1X, just talking. Him just talking for at 1X, Rory Sutherland. A lot more on TikTok than it. He works at Ogilvy and he just breaks down psychological marketing stuff. And it, every word that comes out of his mouth is gold. <laughs> so like, you know, so I, I watch that at 1x. And so it does appear that we're going to start talking faster so you can now watch the video at 2x. So I don't think we're going to go to the next question. <laughs> the next question is from Tony Mobley in Newton, Georgia. My sister-in-law spilled coffee on her laptop. She cleaned it as best she could and let it dry for several days. Anything else she should do? Jason? Oh, Tony, I'm so sorry. So I, I, it's hard without knowing exactly which kind of laptop you have here, the form factor. Um, so I'll speak generally. What's going to kill the laptop is the surface tension between things that are really close together. So the water hovering between those two pieces, those two components. The, your best bet really is um, desiccant if possible, and and really just taking the back off and letting it, just letting it dry. If you can give it time, that's the best thing you can do. Courtney? Yeah, it kind of depends on the type of coffee. Was there sugar in it? Was there uh, artificial cream in it? If there was sugar or artificial cream in it, the main problem, most keyboards are constructed on laptops with the kind of an elastomeric so that the contact switches are these little silicone domes in here. The problem is the mechanical thing that uh, makes the key travel uh, horizontally which are tiny little plastic parts that scissor back and forth. And if the the uh, sugar in the coffee gets into there and it starts sticking, uh, it's a major deal to take all those apart and clean them. It's cheaper just to replace the keyboard. Um, and if it, if the liquid got into the electronics of the, uh, of the laptop, then you might have to worry because it can cause corrosion. Uh, so, you know, you can see how well the key, see if any of the keys stick after it dries out. If they are, replace the keyboard. And uh, if, uh, as long as everything else is working, you may run into problems down the line as uh, corrosion starts to creep in from the water in the coffee. Chris, real quick. It may be too late uh, at this stage, uh, uh, Tony, but I have actually saved uh, iPods 
by putting them in rice. Don't forget the rice trick. All right, and don't forget uh, if it if you have rice handy and that's all you have handy, that's good. But desiccant is not going to have any starches get in there. Uh, stick around the rest of the week on office hours. Tomorrow we've got our weekend Q and A. It's also a day where we sort of do testing, and then Sunday, of course, is our introspection day where we talk about internal stuff uh, regarding the show as well as just general questions. And that one is not recorded, so make sure that you tune into it live. And then uh, also be sure to get your questions in. All right, let's go over the next hour. And welcome back. It is the great pleasure of Office Hours to be joined uh, by Chris, uh, sorry, Chris, uh, Colin Christensen and Chris Hunter from Tenacious Venture Studios out of Seattle, Washington. They're specialists in live event production, multicam productions, webcasts. They do uh, live AV services, presentation support, uh, remote internet services. They've worked with the likes of Bill Gates, some TED Talks, Amazon, NASA. The client list is pretty exciting, and we are getting a live from Seattle studio tour, uh, thanks to uh, the efforts by our own guy Cochran. So, uh, Chris, Colin, welcome to the show. Hey, 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 guys! It's Guy here, all the hey, way guy. from Seattle, Washington, where we're downtown, like just right by the Space Needle. For those of you who've ever been here, we're we're not far from there in this beautiful facility. I actually came here years ago to do a shoot, and these guys came in here and renovated this place. So, Colin's going to show us around, and you guys are going to be blown away. We're going to try and jam pack as much as we can. So, feel free to ask questions, vote on those questions, because when we get to the end, you're going to we're going to run out of time. So, we're going to go through first the the what we call the old building, and then you'll see what's what's in, in the mission control, the studio, and maybe we'll take a sneak peek downstairs, which is an even bigger studio. So, Colin, you want to let us yeah, know? Yeah, sure. Thanks, everyone. I'm Colin Christensen, founder and CEO of Tenacious Ventures. Thanks for tuning in and watching. Uh, we're really proud of this space, so we're really excited to show it off. So first off, when you come into the front doors, this is kind of a commons area of the building. This building itself is actually uh, kind of an entertainment hub. So we're the largest leaseholder in the space, but there's several other companies in the space as well that specialize in the entertainment industry and media production. Um, so this is kind of our shared space. Um, this is when you come in, it's a kitchen area. This is where the client can come in and lounge. Um, we can turn it into more of like a cafeteria style for meals and lunches for larger productions. When we're gonna have like 30 or more people on site, this is where we'll kind of have them hang out. But come and check out some of the other cool stuff that we have. So first here, we're gonna enter in. This is our dedicated space here when we go through these doors. Um, it's first off, this is our break room. So we'll have a little mini fridge so that we can stay within our consolidated space. Um, when we, again, have smaller shows, this will be kind of the eating area and lounge area for our clients. Um, so as you can see here, just coffee, breaks, snacks, typical stuff. And then this is a, these are all flex offices. Right now it's set up as an office that uh, kind of a, a lounge office that the client can hang out in. They can see what's happening in the studio so we can change this multi-view to any of the multi-view feeds that we have back in our broadcast center in the mission control, but it's totally configurable. Everything in this space, uh, our concept is anything goes anywhere. So even if you see up in the corner here, we have these little, uh, little Fostec Dante speakers and even like we can feed anything that we want from our audio mixer into any of these spaces. We have several of these in these little flex spaces so that we can, again, have music playing in separate rooms or we could have the program of the show, we can do PA announcements, whatever we need to kind of get the clients like comfortable. So let's check out some of the other spaces we have here. So this room is typically hair and makeup and wardrobe is what it typically ends up getting used for. Um, so that's where it has really nice soft lighting that's built into the ceiling to allow the hair and makeup artists to really like do their job instead of having to bring complimentary light. But even then we still have some ceiling mounted lights just in case they want it a little brighter. And again, we'll typically have a multi view in the room so that they even see what's happening as well. And then this next room this is what we consider our secondary mission control room. So we actually have all the wiring, all the 12G SDA, SDI snake cables. We have a 10G network, everything set up in here, even dedicated audio feeds, analog feeds, just so we can set this up as a secondary remote mixing station. Um, and then the hair and makeup gets converted into a remote uh, video feed 
system that we can pull into the space. Um, but for now, it's set up as another office, and there's like two different, uh, three different desks that people can sit at, and as Guy is showing, we got a little window into the studio as well, so if they wanted to check out what's going on in there, they could take a peek. That's so, so then, cool. let's show you the path then that they would take as the client and talent to get into the studio space. And down this hall, for those of you know who with Bad Animals, if you remember the Heart album, Bad Animals is actually down this hallway as well. We're going to hang a right into the studio, and you'll. That's that's the door though, right there is Bad Animals. And they even have a build out that they did with uh, a suspended recording studio for sound, oh, sound. Yeah. and it's like incredible what they built in there. So it's really awesome to have them right next door to us that we can go just knock on the door and be like. We have an audio issue, can you help us? <laughs> <laughs> so now this is the studio space here. Um, so basically, we have our lighting grid up top. That's our uh, full lighting grid. Uh, it's about uh, 13 feet tall, approximately, it was, it was what it is to the grid. So we can hang all these lights and have enough overhead space that they're not like cramping the overall production like you do when you go to an office. And we've done lots of shoots like that, so it's really nice to have a dedicated space like that. You see here, we have uh, monitors on each side uh, that can show the notes for the production. So when we have a panel discussion, the moderator can sit here and literally look over the head of the person they're talking to and have line of sight to their notes. Oh, wow. We also have, if you swoop around here, this is our set here that is our generic set, but we also have our confidence monitors down here uh, that have similar information around the notes. It could be teleprompter. Uh, we can, we've configured this to even more screens and monitors as well. You wanna go in and just do a little bit closer of a shot there, Michael? So you can see we have our robo teleprompter and we really actually love these robo teleprompters because you can put your, we have the UE150 Panasonic robo in there and what's cool about it is we can move the camera around and not actually have to move the teleprompter like you do with most traditional camera-based teleprompters. So it gives us amazing flexibility with, with the overall shot that we're getting from that camera. It doesn't lock it off essentially. So we absolutely love that. And then the talent, uh, talent monitor for whatever reference points we need. Um, and then any of the program feeds so we can reference what's actually happening with the overall show. So. Yeah. And the UE-150s you have, how many of them? I see one, two, three, and then I just noticed there's another one up above us. Yeah, we just did a show for Disney uh, a week and a half ago where they had the Lorcana card set. And okay. so we're using it as an overhead shot um, so that basically we could get a close-up look at the cards that they were showing off and then we could cut to the graphic of the card afterwards. So it made it a more interactive show. But to answer your question, uh, we have eight of these uh, UE 150s. We don't have them all set up in here right now, but that's the total that we have. So we can kind of split them between shows when we're doing some shows, we're doing like two robo camera shows, or sometimes we are using all eight. So it depends. But what I love about these cameras as well is just, and I made this pitch to NASA when we did the, the Artemis one launch, uh, we did the Callisto mission and uh, took three cameras from the Orion space capsule as went around the moon. But in the room, we actually, they had nine cameras set up and I said, guys, guys, like we can cover all the shots and angles in here with three robo cameras. Oh, wow. So let's get these tripods out of there. Let's just set it up and have three robo cameras in there to cover all the shots. So we did end up doing that and it, and it made for a much more dynamic show than just the static cameras. And that you're doing 4K up. out of these into a constellation, is that the workflow? Correct, so we have, uh, so and it depends on the show. Some shows we're just doing 1080, we're even doing just 1080 right now, but we have the workflow and the cabling and everything set up so we can do 4K at 60 frames per second into our constellation and then switch the show like that. And then we have all of our, uh, the record decks are limited to only 30p that we currently have. So we'll do 4K 30 or 29.97 is typically what we end up doing uh, when it's just a, a typical 4K show, but the cameras themselves can go up to 60. And I noticed that everything's baseband. You're not doing much NDI here or any NDI or what's... We have everything. We do have everything set up to do NDI. So we have the capabilities to do that, but we don't do it that often. So we'll use NDI as a secondary kind of like video feed for certain things that are low priority. Yeah. Um, and we do that even when we're doing on-site shows um, that are at client offices or in the field. 
Um, but we haven't really made the full move to depending fully on NDI because I just feel like the quality of the straight feeds over SDI on a 12G copper cable is a lot better. And then this look that we have right now with these colors, how easy is it to change these scenes and dial everything in for a yeah. different look? So we're using the uh, aperture lights. So all of these, except for some of the ETC source for series two daylight um, episodal lights, we have some of those there, but mainly everything is aperture. Um, so we have for the psych wall wash or the Aperture Nova 600 C's, which, yeah, you can pretty much like use the, the Sidious app. I always say it wrong. It's Sidious, Sidious or, Link. Sidious, Sidious Link. <laughs> Sidious Slide. I always say it like either way. But yeah, so it's all connected to there. And it, it gives us amazing configurability that, that we can do with each of these lights. So uh, Alex is operating Robos right now. He's our, our lighting tech. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of team members that are actually like, like a Swiss Army knife. That, that I, I love to have Swiss Army knife people around that can do multiple things. Like even our camera up here, Michael, like he, he can do video switching, he can do the telecommunications, and now he's doing glide cam for that. And just so you guys days. know, uh, what we're you're seeing is a Ronin 4D uh, that Michael's been touring us around with, and it is an awesome, awesome setup. He's got the easy rig. Uh, I want to be him. I want to be like Michael. Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the really cool thing that I always think is funny, I don't know if you guys have seen on, on like Instagram stories or TikTok, they have the old school gimbal system, which is a GoPro mounted to a chicken's head. Oh. And then because birds, if you move them around, they keep their head pretty solid. This yeah. thing reminds me of that. It's like the advanced chicken wow. head. <laughs> I just saw him moving it up and down like, wow. And it's still just, it's yeah, it just stays, stays in position. Um, so yeah, I wanted to show you guys just some of our, our history of the company. Um, and I'll do this really quick because I really want to get back to the studio tour. Um, but basically, like in the early days, uh, so Tenacious Ventures was founded and created by me in 2009. And then it was just a web camera and a laptop. <laughs> and I'd show up to events and stream them to social media and use Twitter, which was a brand new thing at the time. Was, um, was this even in HD or was this like in standard definition? No, this is, this is even, this was 640, 640 by uh, 360? 480. Oh, 480. Yeah. Wow. So it was, it was, yeah, early, early days in the streaming world, but I decided to specialize in live streaming because I saw that uh, I used to work for ESPN. I saw them go from tape to digital. And so I was like, this is going to be big. This is going to be the future. I'm going to specialize in this. Um, so basically, if you if you want to so show the slide up here, Chris, um, basically, we, we have live streaming that we did across multiple different shows. Um, a bit, one of the biggest pinnacles was I ended up getting connected uh, to some people that wanted to live stream from Haiti during right after the 2010 earthquake. And so it was one of the biggest challenges to get a live stream out of the poorest country in the entire Western Hemisphere after an emergency aid epidemic. Um, so that was huge. Um, we ended up having uh, like Bill Gates, Bill Gates' team for the Gates Notes Foundation approached me and wanted me to start flying around the country streaming his shows and events. So I started flying around with a huge PC tower to essentially <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a, ca a luggage case. Yeah. So that was cool. We did a lot of interactive shows in, on blue jeans in the early days for Zillow. Blue jeans, what? And we did this thing called the company wave where we'd pull in all their camera feeds on blue jeans and then do a company wave around the organization. This is again back early days. We did live interactive shows for Avalara to do like pulling people from, this is a person in India, one in the United Kingdom, and then joining them to the panel. Um, this is 2019. Um, so you kind of see there's an evolution that we had for one of our clients, Avalar, of just continuing to do their shows. This, you can see like where it kind of went to during the pandemic. We did a live studio, almost like a television show. Yeah, now you show. got a jib. Yeah, the yeah, evolution's this, pretty intense. So it was crazy. More monitors, bigger cameras. It was crazy seeing it from the early days because it was like a web camera and a laptop yeah. with very like the boxes of the corporate look moving into the world where it was television style production with lots of money being dumped into the production value. So the evolution of webcasting has just been big. Here you can see more of a wide angle shot of the setup that we did for this company meeting. We had three different stages, a talk show area, interactive LED wall, and a game show area. And all of this set was custom built, shipped up to Seattle, and then we produced this just heavily live interactive television show basically for their company meeting. So there's been some really cool stuff like that that we've done. Here's another view of it. Um, we do a lot of on-site broadcasts. This was during the pandemic where we set up green screens to socially distance people and then green screen them out to look like they were on the same panel sitting right next to each other. Oh. We've done a lot of hybrid events. 
This is the NASA show, so you can see the images of the Orion space capsule as it's going around the moon. Um, so we took those feeds. I, I actually see this, this is like one of my claim to fames now, is that we literally had zeros and ones from the image of the moon as the space cops going around it, those zeros and ones go over the deep space network, down to Earth, and then flow through our video switching system. So <laughs> wow. our 8K constellation has literally zeros and ones from the moon. <laughs> that's bananas. That's so so cool. I, thought, I thought that's just incredible. It was like, a, it was a challenge. I could literally talk forever about some of the stuff there. Um, we've done a lot of live interactive LED wall stuff where we'll basically have uh, panel discussions. This is, we do, we've done a lot of investor days for clients. So American Eagle and Peloton cold called us during the pandemic to produce shows for them. This actually used to be the system that we have here installed in my house. Um, in my, and I see all those <laughs> Zoom drones. Those yeah. are this yeah. Zoom pinning farms. Yeah, Zoom pinning farms that we, we installed pretty much like a lower level system that we have here. And then we moved it to our studio here. Um, so we're going to show you all this stuff. This is the floor plan, the layout. We'll get into this stuff next. Um, so that's that's what I wanted to show you there. Um, but you well, want to go yeah, check out the rest? Check out, yeah, these guys all are right. excited to see what we're going to show. Go. Keep those questions coming in, guys. As uh, you see stuff, uh, I mean, even the monitors, the lights, the cameras, the wiring. Well, oh, and we haven't you know, even got the, the audio. Outside of the gear, guy, I, I really just am amazed at, you know, in just 15 years, how you have all pivoted from, you know, like you said, set a laptop with a webcam to now one of the nicest studios I think a lot of us have ever seen. What do you, what do you attribute your ability to pivot and continue to grow at such a, at such a, you know, tenacious rate? <laughs> I mean, Fun. I mean, it really comes down to kind of, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the labor, like Chris, if he wants to cut to a picture of himself and wave. So that's Chris Hunter right there doing that. He's going to speak a little later on the video switching station. Um, but like just the team that we have around us is like Swiss Army Knife. So kind of at the early stage of growth of a company, I just see that kind of talent um, able to really help the team and help the company grow. So I think the, the labor is definitely an imperative part of that. The other piece to it is, as Chris will even show you with our video switching system, we've automated a lot of processes that used to take a lot of people. Like so, what? so for example, uh, we could actually technically have Chris operating the robos, doing the video switching, um, operating the graphic system to put Tyler live in. He could be advancing the PowerPoint slides from there, all from that one station, because everything's controllable over the local area network over the, the LAN system. So, and then everything's been so streamlined with macros as they started to come out mm -hmm. that it really took away the need to have a dedicated person per position. Um, so there's a lot of automation that happens like that for smaller shows. But if you get back to the big shows, definitely you still have to have the dedicated people position. But then you start to have the budgets to do that. So that's where we've come up with a very nimble system. Like Chris and I can actually fly out to a, uh, to a location with just the two of us and we'll, we'll have a fully interactive broadcast with remote virtual cameras coming in over Zoom. The video is switching. We'll have iMag that goes up. We'll have the robo cams being controlled. We have the webcast system and the PowerPoints that we're advancing for the clients. So how so, many cases is, are you, just two of you, and that's like nine cases? Four. Four? We got it down to four. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. So that's the other thing is very nimble systems that can go and tra be transported anywhere. Highly talented people that know how to do multiple roles and are also open to doing that because there is pushback sometimes uh, that people want to be a specialist in an area. Um, but I love it when we can get them to almost a specialist level across at least three different systems uh, because then that enables us to travel with them and, and have them. Yeah, and if somebody gets hurt or somebody gets ill, you're able to cover so a yeah. decent spot. Well, let's yeah. take a look. Uh, let's continue we here. One, Alex, did you want to jump in with something before we move on? Sure. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah, as, as you're going there, uh, what, uh, yeah, go. what, what comm systems are you using? Yeah, so that's... <laughs> is that what you're coming to the show us? So that's... Uh, well, I'll, we, I'll open that up and show we'll you now. We'll open it up then. over here. There's one of the cases. Yeah, so we are using the Riddell Bolero system. Oh, yeah. And so this is like, I searched far and wide. I was going to get the clear comm system. And then I just, I hated how big of a brick the thing is. And I'm like, oh. I don't want to put that on my client and have it this brick of a system they're toting around everywhere. So we did the Bolero system. It's got 12... Uh, party lines, 
um, and then six can be displayed on the actual belt pack at any given time so that you can speak in and talk to any of those six channels. You can do you can do point to point. You can connect your cell phone via Bluetooth and even receive phone calls and even push the phone calls live what? into your system um, because we also have a, an IO box that connects to the system that allows us to convert any signals in there to analog so Jared can feed it into the audio mixer. Um, it, it, they're just incredible little systems like and then just the, again the size of it and the thing that they really love about this is it's actually got a beer bottle opener on it as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so, so it's literally like, and the part of why they did this is because statistically when you look at a lot of comm systems, this little clip breaks off. So they basically said, look how powerful and strong our clip is. You can literally open a beer bottle with it. So <laughs> that's, that's that's how durable it is. So now, we, yeah, we love this. If you have remote producers that are watching, what, how do you uh, integrate them to that to that system? So if they're you know if they're not, if they don't have any hardware um, at their location. Yeah. So basically, we just connect it to a Zoom call. Um, so we can actually, with our I.O. box, take our Zoom feed and we could technically feed in on another back channel. We usually set up a separate Zoom meeting for presenters. Mm -hmm. um, instead of doing the same meeting, we'll have the presenter meeting and then we'll have the show meeting. Mm -hmm. And then that back channel, we can actually have uh, only key people on our team will usually be set up, but then we can actually talk to the Zoom feed and then hear the Zoom feed back into the mm -hmm. headset. And and the uh, and that's for producers as well. Like so, that's like that. You'll just have a Zoom meeting for and, and tie them back into the Bolero system. Correct. And even mm -hmm. what we did just last week for our uh, Disney production is we had that set up for the back channel here in the studio, so we could talk to the director that they wanted mm -hmm. that was in LA, and then he could kind of give some input and keep us on track to what the show flow was supposed to be. And then in addition to that, we even had IFBs set up for the host and the talent, where we set right. up a secondary Zoom meeting on his cell phone then, and then he would mute and unmute to be able to talk into the IFB. That's great. And yeah, for the, IFB, um, you're using Electro M2T, M2? Yeah, so, so these are the IFB systems right here. So we have the M2Rs, um, and then we have two of those currently. So that's what Guy and I are actually yeah. uh, on to hear you guys as you're speaking to us so that we can have an isolated feed on that. And, yes. you know, this, this show runs on Zoom ISO. Uh, we're, so there's, we're always curious when we see a pinning farm of why, why you're using a pinning farm. Let's just we, give you guys a shortcut then and go check that out. Which way? This way? Let's just go pinning farm. Let's go pinning farm. <laughs> So, so we, this is something that Chris and I have literally tested thoroughly over and over and over again. We are trying to come up with a system that actually will, will take this and com like compress it into a smaller system. Um, but what we've seen, we have a Zoom ISO system as well, but what we've seen for our needs on shows, it's not the tool that really does what we need it to do. Like we'll send the countdown clock, the PowerPoint feed, um, a teleprompter feed, uh, and any other support systems back into Zoom. So we'll need a dedicated system uh, to do that. This gives us the flexibility that we need, also the redundancy. So if the Zoom ISO machine were to go down, we lose everything. Here, if a machine goes down, we just move to another machine. And so we can continue on with the show, repin somebody in another system. We have several failover points. So we have a primary and a secondary for every single meeting that we have. So we can just turn on the camera, turn on the audio. Our texts are already ready to go and rehearsed on how that failover happens. So that if we lose anything or lose a machine, we can do that. There's common times where sometimes we've connected and bridged up to four meetings. We can bridge Microsoft Teams meeting to Zoom meetings to Cisco meetings. And then we'll just set up the different interactivity across the machines. And then the clients that we're working with can use the platform that they are familiar with that's in their org. Um, so since we're doing a lot of corporate stuff, that's what we ended up setting ourselves up to do. Whereas the, the, the Zoom ISO, we've even been talking to Guy a lot about the virtual uh, vMix systems and virtual stuff. And we're constantly trying to figure out how we could innovate and adapt the new tools into our workflow. But so far, this, this has been the most reliable for us. And what, uh, what IP system backbone are you using? Some version of a Cisco or something, or Ubiquiti, or what do, what do you use to kind of tie everything together? So we actually use, uh, let's, well, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Let's, let's go <laughs> let's check go out there. the next step the on the server tour. Rack. 
So we actually use, for our internet system, we use a Cradle Point uh, 3100 is what we have currently set up in our server closet. And then that has failover redundancy. So we have two different networks coming in um, and then it'll fail over to the second network if the primary fails. And then from there, we have uh, it branches into the switches so that it'll feed network IP Come addresses to five different networks that we have set up on site. So we have our first network is our, T, our AV net. That's, that's a 10G network with a full 10G backbone across the studio. We have our Dante network, that's a 1G network. We have our comms network, just in case we need to expand our comms system across the, the building. Then we have our smart network for any smart devices we have on site, because we want those to be totally separate from our networks. Then we have a client network um, that's just for the client to connect to for their internet that's segmented from our network. Um, and they all have different IP uh, subnets, so that again, they stay, stay off of the same subnets. So there's one QNAP there and one down below. How much storage is in these? Yeah, so we have the, the QNAP TVS systems. Um, and what's amazing about those is they're on the 10G network. So we can wow. literally edit 4K footage from any device, from editing any editing machine that's connected to the 10G network. They're about 130 terabytes each is what they hold. They're in a RAID 5 configuration. So if any of the drives were to fail, we just have to replace the drive and it will rebuild itself. Um, there's also like really laser fast um, SD cards, SSD cards that are in there. Um, and then we also have the, the miniaturized little M2 uh, SSD cards for even faster throughput. Um, so we'll use that for offloading and we'll use those for like uh, a different network for the client to be on to share files on the network. So those are, those are incredible, we love those. Next to it over here, we have the rack that we have 16 record decks. We actually do isolated records of every single camera and every single feed, typically for all the shows that we're doing, so that we can do a multi-camera edit after the show and rebuild the show exactly the way we want it, if there was any mistakes or awkwardness to it. Um, and the way and you're, using, hubs, uh, you're using Blackmagic uh, 40 by 40s? Uh, we do. So we have two. We're actually getting ready to replace this with the 80 80. by 80. Yeah, yeah that's, they that's start shipping. Yeah, that's on our next uh, task list. But we're using two 40 by 40s in here plus a 20 by 20, and then we have uh, two multi-view 16s that we can route anything to to have our 16 box multi-view, and then we have our 8K constellation backup batteries just in case the power goes out that we can keep this core online um, down there as well. And wow. then we. And then we have a TF rack for mixing the audio in those other rooms is essentially like a sub audio mixer, just so we could segment the audio going to the rooms separate from our primary Yamaha TF5 board. Yeah, wow. Uh, we do have a lot of producer questions stacking up. Is there anything uh, that you wanted to really wanted to make sure that you showed us before we started getting into yeah. uh, questions so from our listening producers? Let's go to Chris. I'll be quick quick about this then. So this is our RoboCam operating station. I mentioned Alex earlier. He also does our lighting. So we use this as an engineering station and a RoboCam op area. This is Jared here on the Yamaha TF5. So he's doing all the audio control, making sure all the feeds and, and the Dante and audio feeds are going where they need to go. This is our client station. We have two, then we have two teleprompters that are here that can go anywhere we need them. Two PowerPoint presentation machines, two countdown clocks. And then here is our, like we already covered, our pinning station. We have our primary, primary and secondary webcast machines. So those are just in case we have failover, we can fail over with those. And then let's go ahead and take a look at Chris's station. So if you want to loop around, Chris can kind of take it from here and show you the station. But hi, my name is Chris Hunter, and uh, this is kind of where we take care of all of our feeds. Um, I leverage Companion and Streambex pretty heavily, and uh, I can basically route any source anywhere in the studio just from this position uh, with several pages of stream decks and companion. I also use a, a 1ME panel, just standard panel, if I need to use it for any other uh, quick changes in super sources and things like that. But I really leverage stream decks and, and uh, companion. Uh, we also have our playback system here. We use QLab so I can run playback. We use a new blue Tyler Live uh, Captivate for our lower thirds and any other graphics that we integrate. So that all is operated from here. Um, and then I have another um, control panel for our robos. Uh, if we have a simple show where I don't need a, sec uh, a secondary operator, I can really run cameras, 
switch the show, graphics, playback, everything from here. You wanna you wanna talk more about the Robo controller? That's one of the questions we have. Yeah, what, so what, what, this, what is the RP, this is the Panasonic RP150, and we use that in conjunction with the UE150s. Um, we have some UE70s as well, but we um, primarily use the 150s. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great system because you've got the, um, you know, the one controller that allows you to zoom, focus, pan, and tilt just from one so I can leverage my left hand to switch and control at the same time. So uh, if would, anybody's used this panel, it's, it's it's a pretty nice little panel. And what's really cool is Chris has also kind of came up with the, the companion software so that he can like switch and store presets with the Robo controller. So it, it makes for a really handy, really cool way to operate and pull up and be able to name your yeah. presets in the system. Yeah, so yeah, again, companions just become kind of, you know, when a lot of old, I'm kind of old school, I've been around for a long time. Uh, so if anybody knows the Grass 110 switcher, that's what I learned on. So. I used to be an engineer with Bexel, and we used to have to time things in. People don't know that anymore. Subcare and H phase and proc amps, those all went the way of the dodo, but. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of us here with you. And that was most of, uh, that was most of Roscoe Jones' question from Madison, Indiana. But the other part of it was, uh, is it PoE++ that's powering those? Well, um, actually, the, for, you're talking about the UE150s? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we do have uh, uh, some switches that we could show you that switch if you want on, in the in the rack. If you want to go out to the rack, Michael, um, and show them what he's talking sure. about. So we do have, um, but yes, PoE plus uh, plus, uh, and we use regular power supplies for some of the robos. And we do have a switch that has PoE that will sometimes power the ro the robos that way. But this is the rack that powers all the PoEs in the studio. So you can see the power supplies in the rack there. Um, and they're they're just power injectors essentially. Yeah, and even when we're on a show like remote shows on on site, yeah, we have a we have a rack a switch that yep. basically also provides the PoE plus plus. Yep. Um, so when we don't want to bring these with us, um, we'll usually use that. Yeah. Bill, I uh, wanted to get to the next question. Next one comes from Kyle Hammond in Chicago, Illinois. And Kyle says, can we see more of the mobile rig that you used to do the walkthrough at the beginning? Yeah. yeah. Michael's here with the Ronin 4D with, I believe, a Sony. Which lens is that on there, Michael? Sony? Sony FE. That's the 14, I 14? believe. Yeah. Want to come forward just a little, little bit more, Michael, so we'll get you into the white. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. There you go. Want to zoom in on that over there, Alex? Yeah, this is the chicken head that I'm talking about. I also think of it as like a Velociraptor. <laughs> 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 so yeah, overall this camera, this has been an awesome tool to work with. We bring it to a lot of our graduations, to some of the cool behind the scenes B-roll shots. Um, we just did a Kretsu Forum Northwest that investor meeting. That one was meeting. amazing. When the stage shots, uh, when Michael was told to go go Ronin over comms, I, I just would look and see these magical shots coming yeah. through. And it, compared to my PTZs, it was like, oh man, Michael's stealing the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's such a versatile little tool because again, it's it's a gimbal. Uh, uh, it can hold. It's a it's full frame, so it does full frame. It's got a full frame sensor on it, and you can record ProRes RAW. Um, externally, because there was like a upgrade. Yeah, there was an. Oh, an, oh yeah. Technically, the, the there was red a, thing. Technically, there was a ProRes. You could have recorded internally, but Red owns the IP for yeah. that. So then Nikon now. Yeah, they had to, they had to then like, all right, well, we got to add an external recorder to get around the intellectual property that Red registered. Um, so we got that, but it's really cool being able to do, shoot and log an Apple ProRes RAW in 6K. And then we just posted it and into the edit. And it just came out with an 8K. Crisp. You gonna get the 8K version? No, we, we're, <laughs> we're for all of, for all of our shows. We really don't need 8K at this point. Like yeah. even the 6K for live production. Not a lot of shows are broadcasting in, sure. in even 4K, to be honest. Wow. Um, but we'll shoot in 4K for behind the scenes stuff as needed. So then, how does this transfer? How are we wirelessly sending this over? Yeah. So if you want to swoop around and show your the monitor here. This is like DJI is just the pioneer in, in like video transmission over the air. So this this is the transmitter. You can also have it as a secondary control device. So if you wanted a second operator, you can set the focus, 
Um, you can move the camera head around and then just have Michael, what he's doing, he can just be moving around to the positions and then we could have a second operator actually controlling this. But the distance on this thing is incredible. Like you, you can truly get it. Like, uh, like in good conditions, you could get it like some of the drones where it's almost like a mile away. Like it's just, Bananas. it's just insane, the transmission. I mean, again, that's good conditions. 5,280 feet. Yeah, I mean, Teradex like 2,000. I mean, this. Yeah, no, it, this is insane. It's literally like the drones when you're operating. Like we have the Mavic 3 Cinema Pro, uh, the or Mavic 3 Pro Cinema. So it shoots in pro res and, and again, like even that thing, like it's amazing that it can transmit at least a video signal for preview um, up to three miles away. So it's so insane. So you buy this as an add-on, right? How much is just the receiver? Um, all in the whole system was around like 14,000. With I the think. codec? With, with all that. that. Oh no, then that would bring it up to like 16,000. <laughs> <laughs> that was like an afterthought. I, I can't remember the exact cost of what that was for that piece of it, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a spendy kind of system for, for, but I mean, if you compare it to stuff that came before, it's actually yeah, it's cheap. Steady cams yeah. and bigger film cameras or um, some of these ENG cameras where just the lens was 30 grand. Oh, so yeah. all of a sudden, I yeah. mean, this with the lens for 16. Yeah, and we have two different lenses because Sony came out with their light lens series for uh, like mobile uh, gimbals like this. And they, they just work incredibly well. So the, the Sony FE series is purposely designed to be light, lighter than other lenses. Let's get to the next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next, and Douglas says, have you thought of adding or expanding into virtual production with an LED volume? Yes, so we actually have done several shows with LED volumes, and uh, I was literally gonna buy an LED wall for this space, but then I actually started to think about like what that means from a multi-camera perspective, and you actually start to get limited with with having an LED wall. It's usually a little better for like two camera solutions unless you have a major space that you're set up in. Actually, speaking of major space, we probably have enough time to walk down there. You wanna hit yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, we can go check out the downstairs studios. But but what instead we've been actually doing is we've been looking at the, the Vive Mars system. Oh yeah. Um, so what we're actually considering doing is that? painting like one of the sides a green screen in here, and then we have all the camera trackers to put on our cameras. These PTZ cameras actually feed the telemetric data into Unreal Engine. So we can leverage our PTZ cameras, we can set the tracker on top of a camera, we can configure the lenses, and then we can literally be using Unreal Engine with 3D created environments looking like we're actually there. So that's the level of virtual production that we're actually going to move into um, because the, I didn't really feel like the LED walls were the highest quality of where they should be for a production. You really need to get to like 0.9 pixel pitch to really get it to and your cameras. And then you can't move those, right? They have to stay here. Right? Precisely, so so that's where that you can't pack them up and bring on the road. As soon as you get there, it's a permanent install. Um, but if you're gonna do like 2.3 pixel pitch and around there, then you can pack it up and move it, but then you get more, you get aliasing, you get all these problems that start to occur. And so, again, we rent them for certain shows to use them, but I, I just feel like the technology isn't there. Like even when I was looking, there wasn't even a 10G, like plug that you could plug into the wall to control the wall everything was 1g so then you had to route a 1g cable to each of the tiles to be able to control it and i was just like that's so unnecessary because we're already we have 10g networks and now they do now they are having a 10g plug um, but even like the sdi feeds for copper feeds for the video signal like some of them they didn't even have a 12g copper signal going in it was still all just 3g so then you had, you had to do the four breakouts for 4k to have four 3G signals. And you know that technology is just changing so <laughs> fast every couple of years, so then all of a sudden you're gonna have to invest in a new wall because the yep. place down the road just bought the new one. So it's just a game that you're trying to yeah. keep that thing working for all, all those Yeah, guys, and this is Chris. Uh, and just to leverage, or just to kind of piggyback on what you guys are talking about, if anybody's familiar with um, the uh, Socially You in Tennessee, that, that studio, we're really, uh, we've been in contact with them, so we're gonna be moving in that kind of direction with regards to what Colin was just talking about there with using Unreal Engine and green screen stuff. Yeah, and especially with generative AI starting to go down the direction that you can generate 3D worlds. Like that's, that's a game changer. Because my thought is like it, the whole ecosystem is pretty expensive to have that level of live production. 
But the graphics side of things, if you can just go in and create a 3D environment just with a generative AI like prompt, that'll, that's going to drastically lower the cost. And then when you really have a client that wants to refine it, then you still have to go the old fashioned route of having like a designer come in and build a 3D environment and really layer it out. But as far as like bringing that scale of production at a lower budget to some of our corporate clients and the people we're working for, like we would love to do the next show in here that we're going to do for Disney to have a full like live virtual production set with a 3D environment. Then you could have like Mickey Mouse or somebody hopping on in as a, as a, over a front level graphic overlay so that they would they actually cross the people and look like they're kind of interacting yeah, with them it's some serious depth so it's like so there's some really cool things that you can do with that the only downfall is it it's a green screen so if you're going to do iso records of that if you want to do more post with it then then you still have to go through that green screen process but that can also be a benefit like because with the led wall you get what you get yeah um versus mm -hmm. this gives you ultimate flexibility so I'm definitely all about ultimate flexibility, and I also want to attract like Hollywood-style television shows and movies to be able to come and shoot in the space where they're leveraging that, that scale of virtual production that gives them the flexibility in post to really clean things up. Right, and downstairs, the next they, question. they've shot some huge movies downstairs in that, that big old yeah. uh, space. Uh, yeah. Going to the next question, Kyle Hammond in Chicago says, can we see the new borderless multi-view in the Constellation 8K update? <laughs> yeah, that's a Chris question. Go for it, Chris. <laughs> oh. This is turning it off. Ooh. Should have seen it. Uh, the one bad thing about it is you don't get your tallies. Yeah. So one that goes off like that, you don't get your tallies. Um, you can change the color of it also when it's on. So if I wanted to change the color of the border, I could. Um, oh, that's cool. So yeah. any, any color you want. It's a lot of CJs. Yeah. <laughs> now it's a lot of bills. Uh -huh. yeah, that's a lot of bills ignore now. Ignore the picture in picture. <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, next question. Next question comes to us from Eduardo Augustine in Panama, and Eduardo says, I started with the webcam and a laptop and working hard on getting better. What was the one thing that changed everything for Tenacious that others could replicate to grow like you did? I mean, the big thing is everything has been bootstrapped. I didn't take any outside investment. Everything has been poured back into the company. I didn't really pay myself at all for the first five years. So <laughs> wow. I, was, I was living like super cheap, um, running cables across my apartment. Um, but the, the big thing that changed was really getting access to things like vMix and Wirecast. Um, so Wirecast in the earlier days was more of the primary one. vMix, it existed, but it had a different purpose altogether. The pandemic is when they really upgraded the vMix system to more incorporate live mixing um, for cameras. So I would say like software like Wirecast, because in the, in the early days, my big pitch to everyone was all this stuff that we see in the studio in the back room, it's going to disappear and everything's going to be a laptop. Everything can be switched on a laptop. Um, and, and I definitely had that mentality, pushed that mentality for a long time until I got to this scale. And then I realized, well, actually, the laptop system is going to be, as it evolves, taking care of the, the lower quality productions but it's still gonna be really good, but it's not gonna be the scale like 4K, 6K, 8K. It's not gonna give you the flexibility that you, that you can with this kind of a system that's more of a breakout. But I would say that's the key right there though, is leveraging vMix, leveraging Wirecast, whatever your preference is, and then scaling up from there to reinvest the money back into the gear that's gonna bring you to the next level. It's awesome. awesome. Thank you. Next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas says, do you have any future plans to migrate to network video, either ST2110 or NDI? 2110 is where we're looking. So um, NDI, again, it hasn't been as reliable as we want it to. We've, it's been more reliable now, um, but it's not as reliable, obviously, as like, uh, as like a wired connection. So for the most part, like we'll use, probably use NDI as a secondary kind of system and sometimes as a backup system. Um, but 2110, that's, that's where we're going. That's where everybody's going in the broadcast world. So that's going to be our, our next iteration when we, when we get to it. And we're kind of set up with our back, backbone for that. Greg Gibson in Washington, D.C. is curious, where did you get the dual stream deck stands and are they publicly available? That's a Chris question. He found them. <laughs> 
I got those on Etsy and they were like $50. They were super cheap. Um, <laughs> there's a new guy though that I've discovered. Uh, he builds these really neat ones um, and he actually builds them with um, a Pi computer inside of it. So um, I forget his name now, but he's, uh, I think he's in Vegas. Um, but uh, I'm probably going to move in that direction. They're a little more polished. Next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. How have your skills had to change as you grew, and where have you found the skills you've needed to hire? Yeah, so my skills are still changing because <laughs> I kind of like in the beginning, I was the one operating everything, super technical. I was coming up with the systems that, that we were using. Um, and then once, once I met Chris and then uh, hired him, and well, he was a freelancer at first. We would just really get along great. And so then eventually hired him as full time um, because our, our personalities get along great. We both have thick skin when things get tough on tough job sites. But really kind of like innovating for me now, I'm trying to move more into an administrator role and then offload over a lot of the studio responsibilities, the technical responsibilities to Chris. And so that's been really hard because I always want to put my hand back in it and 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 do that. So that's been one of the evolutions that, that I've had to do. And then skills, I would say, um, again, my strategy of having generalists in the beginning, that's not going to be able to hold in the long term because as the company continues to grow, I'm going to have to start cutting to specialists for certain things and certain activities. Um, so I think that strategy, like I'm part of several entrepreneur organizations like EO, Entrepreneur Organization is one of the largest global EO or entrepreneur networks. Um, I have a lot of contacts that I talk about business growth and business opportunities in there. And, and that is like the next phase of growth that we have to go through. Um, but yeah, multi-skilled Swiss Army Knife people, I think are amazing for the beginning. So if you're starting a company doing this kind of stuff or have a small team, I really think that that's, that's the way to go is those talented Swiss Army Knife people and then specialize later. Next question. Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois is up next. How is the AC power handled and equipment power protection managed in this amazing facility? Yeah, that's a great question. So we actually have a dedicated AC um, and heating system just for our space in the building. Um, so well, there's a control interface on the wall that we can turn it on and turn it off so that when all of a sudden we have a, a live production happening, we turn it off so no noise happens, it doesn't get kicked on. The studio space actually heats up a lot more than the other spaces. So there will be times that we have to kick on the AC right in between breaks for shows, or we'll kick on the AC when we actually have um, before the show and after the show. Then we'll cool the whole space down so the client's comfortable um, with that. So that's, that's the, the, the heating and cooling system. And then as far as power goes, um, all the power is, is coming from the wall and into our APC units in there. And so those are helping regulate the power. And even we have power conditioners that are set up before any of the power hits our devices. So then that way, everything is nice and leveled out and conditioned before it actually interfaces with our gear and equipment. Next question. Ronnie Hofsoy comes to us out of Tromsø, Norway. What are your thoughts about green screen virtual production and live keying for multicam VP? Yeah, so that's what I was touching on earlier um, is the, uh, the, the HTC Mars system. Um, that's what we're looking to move into for that green screen multi-camera production. And again, the comparison I used between an LED wall and using green screen, I just think that there's more flexibility with green screen. There, there's pros and cons to it, but what we're going for is that ultimate flexibility, ultimate post-production capabilities, because um, a lot of clients we're working with um, really like to have that to clean up any of the edits. Uh, if we made any mistakes during the live edit or if a CEO said something that legal didn't want them to say, then we can go in and clean that stuff up pretty easily. So uh, I really like the green screen live production system and, and we're not fully there yet to have it deployed here, um, but, but we've been working on that whenever we're between shows. Next question. Eduardo Augustine from down in Panama says those seven plus stream decks are into multiple devices as appliances with companion satellite or did you do a different workflow? And this one's for Chris. Yeah. Yeah, it's really simple. I'm simply using a couple of USB powered USB hubs going directly into my laptop. Uh, it's a, an MSI gaming laptop. Uh, actually, one of them goes directly into the laptop and, and then the rest of them are 
connected through two powered USB hubs and I have, it's been very reliable and I haven't had any issues whatsoever. Next question. Zach Stallsmith out of Chautauqua, New York. This is awesome. What is the audio flow that allows you to see and hear people in a Zoom meeting like you're doing right now? So I think Jared should answer this question. So Michael, if you wanna glide into Jared and then Jared, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so our general uh, workflow involves a lot of our friendly Dante, Dante AVIO USB dongles. Uh, we have uh, all of our laptops that uh, receive any video chat? feeds uh, use the dongles as their input and output devices. And then here on the console, we do uh, mix minuses for each of the uh, different uh, call setups. So our Interact 1 and 2 will generally be, say, uh, you know, our presenter meeting, uh, you know, primary, secondary backup. And then we have uh, Interact 3, 4 as our broadcast send as well as a couple additional sends so that you know we have mixed minus feeds for each of these independent calls which is what's tying them together all with the power of dante well while we're well, here at the soundboard why don't we get into one more audio question sure yeah, yeah douglas carmichael says i noticed you're using a yamaha tf series audio console have you ever run into any barriers with the limited capabilities of the tf in comparison to higher end consoles Ye yes, I think right now we're kind of pushing the limits of what's what we can do with our needs with the TFs. Uh, one thing I wish I had available on the TF would be uh, better control of input and output delays for individual channels. Um, but uh, we've got some creative workarounds using some of the additional aux buses and effects buses to uh, create that need as we need it. Well, thanks for that peek behind the board. Why don't we head back to Colin uh, for the next question. Uh, Ronnie Hofsoy in Tromso, Norway. How do you handle the different scene changes to prevent them from being too similar between the different productions and clients? Well, that's actually one of the powers of working with corporate clients that have non-public feeds is the fact that uh, their employees in the company only get to see those live shows. So they end up like not knowing what other corporate productions are doing in the studio. So that's where we can use a set like this that's our generic set, and we just recolor it. So we can change the background on the wall color, the up lights on the plants, and even these textures that we have coming in. We'll actually change all those based on each corporate client, but we can leverage the same set for different corporate clients. So that's corporate clients. Um, but when we have like public live feeds, that's where we'll work with uh, set designers and, and builders uh, to basically build out specific sets. And then like you saw on the, the big photo with Avalar's big company meeting with the talk show area, LED wall and the game show area, then we'll have that kind of stuff that's more customized. We'll even grab some of the furniture from their corporate offices and bring it here. Um, like Avalar has a big surfboard table with their brand image on it. So we'll use pieces like that these cups will have different colored cups. Um, so each client has their own cups and we store them here. And then we also have a bunch of furniture stored even at our, we have a secondary storage unit um, where we have some furniture that's more customized per client and they'll buy all that furniture and then we'll just store it for them till their show. Then we'll go get the stuff, bring it in here and set the set more in alignment with what they want. So that's kind of the thing we're, we're starting to work on the next Disney broadcast that we're gonna do here. So. We're going to start designing out a set just for them is the plan. And then it'll be more customized towards Disney's branding. Next question. Sean Johnson in New York comes up next. Do you do any live shots or media tours? And if so, do you do interlaced for those? Uh, so we usually don't do interlaced. We, we have the capability to do it. Um, we did actually have, uh, we had Como 4 News in here and they actually did do a live broadcast from here, um, but they, they usually provide their own cameras for that. So we ended up just giving them internet and then they broadcast back to the studio. We do shows for Microsoft where we're usually doing SRT feeds, but again, that's all, that's all progressive. So we really don't use interlaced that often anymore. And even when we have interfaced and sent feeds, um, usually they'll do whatever conversion or ask for whatever they need and we'll just kind of comply. So. Uh, but again, we don't, we're not really doing a lot of interlaced so much anymore. Next question. Craig McFarlane out of Boston, Massachusetts says, have you been doing any custom development and or automation out of need or opportunity? So 
Yeah, a lot of the stuff in our workflow is very customized. So even like the way that we're programming the macros uh, when Chris is setting up a show with the stream decks, we have we have literally like our 8K constellation is actually completely filled with all the macros that you can build into it. We have templates that we've built um, to provide that. And we have a lot of like picture in picture customization. So for remote shows or hybrid shows with the studio, some of the box looks that we'll use, um, those are all customized with inside the 8K constellation. Likewise with graphics. So we use Tidal Live Broadcast for our graphics. Um, all that stuff will provide more levels of customization. And, and there's even like a lot of just the way the gear Pretty is kind of like chosen and configured together. Um, there, there's a lot of customization there. When it comes, if you're asking about programming and development, we haven't done a ton of development and customization around developing like some of the SDKs or building our own application. So we haven't done a lot of that yet. And we do use Mix Effects Pro quite a bit lately um, because a lot of our box looks I can leverage presets in Mix Effects Pro and not really use my uh, my macro list in the ATEM for a lot of my super sources, so that's become really handy. So I've been lever leveraging that quite a bit. Next question. question. Rian Smith, Smith coming to us from Trinidad, Trinidad down in the West Indies, says, says, how did the sound dampen or soundproof the main studio? Are he seeing black blankets? Uh, yeah, so this is a specialized uh, soundproofing wall uh, for four studios specifically like there's another big studio in seattle called harbor island they have the same sort of thing that they installed in the space um, and then the walls themselves have a special insulation that's used uh, to help sound dampen and then that's there's actually an air gap on the other side of the back side of this uh psych wall behind me over here um, it's basically got an air gap from the street and then also all that sound insulation inside the wall. And then that allows, there's actually a street outside of this studio and you can't hear any of the cars driving by. You can't hear any horns or anything like that in the studio because of how good it is. There's another studio downstairs. If you want to cut to that shot real quick, Chris, just we have a robo down there. And there's actually, that's actually down below where we're sitting right now. And even like if there's stomping and moving around up here, there's a rubber mat and more insulation in the floor to prevent that. Now we have had a band rocking out down there before in advance of bumper shoot, and we could hear that <laughs> through the floor. <laughs> but, but for the most part, it does a really good job. And that, this space down there that you're seeing, um, we didn't get a chance to go down there yet. Um, we might run out of time for that. But it actually is a larger space there's a garage door that can open up and cars can drive into there. Um, so it's a secondary space. It's actually owned by the, build it, the building itself is uh, Victory is the name of it. And so basically this is a secondary studio and we've wired our broadcast center into here. They also have another insert stage that's a, that's a green screen, like a green room. And so we can literally take our studio space here, have a, another show going on in another space and then another show in the green room. We can mix all those shows together. So that's one of the reasons we chose this building to set up the studio in. Um, we leased out the largest space and then we were like, we don't even have to pay for these other studios because they're, they're owned by the building itself. So we, we really have a flexible space here and then having bad animals right next to us as just like experts in audio cleaning. Like the community here in this space is just incredible. So. So we can literally knock on several people's doors. There's another rental shop downstairs with a bunch of gear. So if we don't have all the gear we need, we can just walk downstairs and rent from them and pull it up. And we're super collaborative with, with them. We're more live broadcast specialists and they're more like commercial production. Um, so there is some overlap, but we, we actually hire each other for work all the time. Next question. question. Roscoe, Roscoe Jones, Jones Madison, Madison, Indiana is in next. Is there a correlation between the size of the budget and the percentage of the show that is scripted? And how about correlated to the layers of managers to deal with? Yeah, so I would say that depends on the corporate client. So um, we're really flexible and we try to serve each client as best we can, even if we're stretching ourselves thin, which sometimes and a lot of times we do. Um, so, but yeah, usually like a, I wouldn't say that the budget's tied to scripting though. I would say that that really comes to preparation on the client side. We work, we'll work with green new clients that have no clue what they're doing. And then that's where they come in unscripted. And then we start to have to educate them and train them on what they need to do to have a successful, smooth show. 
Um, and so we'll end up like over time, even the budget doesn't go up or change, we'll still like get them scripting their content. And then that way, when they come to us, we just integrate it into the teleprompter and then likewise their slides. So a lot of that stuff is happening right now internally for corporate clients, for public and commercial shoots, we'll be more involved in that process. Um, but for the most part, we stick that responsibility for our corporations onto them. What really drives up budget and is this is when they want more functionality, when they want a teleprompter, when they want the presentation machine, when they want the clock, when they want the interactivity of remote feeds coming in. Let's say they want they only have two people interacting, then we're good. We'll have one telecommunications op, uh, operator. But we've done shows um, for like PayPal and, and some other shows that we've done for like T-Mobile where we'll have several feeds, like 12 to even sometimes 14 people that we need to pin. So in those kind of scenarios, you obviously need more bodies and more labor. So that's what tends to really increase the price. And then the other piece is we leverage these PTZ cameras to really have it that we can have one camera operator operating all of them. And, and so that decreases labor costs. So we'll pitch that to them. But then if they want like a black magic camera or a red or, or one of the Aries, then that all of a sudden you need the dedicated operator per camera. And then all of a sudden a three camera production can just explode the budget to a really large level because of the, the scale of cameras we're pulling in. So those are really the drivers. Next question. Danny Grizzle in Longview, Texas. Up next, what security implications are there when working with high profile talent? Yeah, so we, we've worked with uh, some pretty high profile people. We've done shows with Jeff Bezos, with Bill Gates. Um, some of the, we've done shows with astronauts. Um, so usually like they'll provide a lot of their security with bodyguards and, and security that comes in like that. Um, obviously within a studio space like this, we're, we're sectioned off so they can have their own private space in here. Some of these offices that we have set up are dedicated for that kind of a thing. Um, we have a security system on the building itself uh, that we can set the alarms for that has motion detectors. Um, a lot of our spaces and our rooms are locked off. We've done shows for Facebook's, Facebook for their engineering conference before where we had to have our computer, our editing system in a locked room, not touching anything on the internet. And then when we finished editing, we had to load the files to a, a, a password protected encrypted drive delivered by hand to them and then delete all the footage off of our system afterwards. So there's stuff like that that we've had to do. And then of course, like um, essentially uh, do a full like defrag almost of the, the hard drives that we're using so that we can clean them. So there's a lot of stuff like that um, that we've had to do in the past. We're looking at installing more like uh, like card based security systems to scan to go into some of the rooms because that's kind of the next level that's that's required for some of like Boeing and some military grade kind of stuff. We've done some shows for them where we came on site to them. But if they were going to use our facilities, we would need to meet that higher security level. Now, we're going to run just a tiny little bit over, so I'm going to try to get through these uh, fairly quickly. We've got about three questions left. Why don't we get to the next question? Uh, Rian Smith in Trinidad in the West Indies wants to know, uh, what's the clicker that remote control Colin's using on the set? Is there a special reason for that one? Yeah, so this is the perfect queue. Um, so basically, it's, it's just, if you're familiar with the perfect queue system, um, it's, a, it's a really, really stable like a clicker that communicates with the PowerPoint system that we have in the back where it's got a USB device plugged into it. And so it allows me to advance the slides. So the slides that I was advancing through earlier, um, I was using this. And then actually I even have another internet clicker that we typically use for uh, some of our remote guests. So anybody in the world can advance the PowerPoints that are in our studio over there. We just send them this link to internetclicker.com and then we're able to then give them the passcode to get in and access this. And so we'll have remote presenters actually advance their own slides during the show um, so that we don't have to handle it if they're more used to advancing it on their own. And that's a, to go back to even the other question about um, budget is oftentimes offloading that onto the client allows them to save some money because then we don't have to have an operator advancing slides for them. And if we have an operator, we usually need a rehearsal. So then we have to have a rehearsal day to make sure they get familiar with the content. Um, so sometimes we'll cut not having re rehearsals for certain shows um, to collapse the budget. Next question. question. Ronnie Hofsoy in Tromsø, Norway says, what cameras will you consider if you will stop using the UE 150s, thinking of when you'll be moving more toward the green screen production? Yeah. So. We've been kind of, I've been kind of waiting to buy another set of cameras. I really like the, the Sony 
the, the Sony FX9s and 6s. Like, I think those are really awesome cameras, but they don't integrate into the Blackmagic system. So then I've leaned towards the Blackmagic Mini Ursas, but I, I, I feel like the, the low light isn't super great on those. And I'm really waiting for their Mini Ursas to have the 10G plug like their new studio cameras do, where you can control the camera, take the feed, and, and really have a lot of this I.O. That, that can just be over that 10G network switch, and then we'll feed it back to the rack and then feed everything where it needs to go. So I would really love Blackmagic to integrate that into their cameras, and, and I would probably buy those. Um, so those are, those are kind of the two I'm looking at is the Sony, the Sony FX uh, 6 and 9 and the Blackmagic. I've looked at Ari's. I've looked at some of the others, um, but... Honestly, I always look at like what I can get for the price and the value that it's providing. And since we're doing a lot of streaming that compresses the feed and then we'll do localized like recording too. But like for the, for the price of the Aries, I can just get several black magic. So I kind of I kind of do that where I look at quality versus the, the, the cost and then see how I can maximize to the next stage of growth that we want to go into. And then if we need that level of camera, then we'll go rent that and bring it in. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, have you used the uh, the FR sevens? The have you tested the Sony FR sevens? I haven't tested the FR sevens yet. Yeah, it's the FX six chip in a BTZ, <laughs> so that's what we use a lot for a lot of our stuff. Yeah, I've I've been looking at those actually because I did want to try them. The only problem with those that I kind of saw is these UE one fifties because they're not a full frame sensor. They have incredible zoom, and so we can set one at the back of the room and zoom all the way to the stage. Whereas the, the, the Sony PTZs with the full frame sensor, um, getting a lens on there that's going to be like a, a servo lens that can zoom in and out and, and also get that range is, I, I haven't seen it yet, if that's possible. It might even yeah, we, break the we thing. Primar <laughs> we primarily use them in a studio environment. So, I mean, that's, that's really more of how we, you know, we don't usually, I don't usually build stuff that goes more than 25 feet. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, it's, so we, we've kind of limited it to that. Yeah, so that's where I've considered it. Because right now we have these two PTZs that are on a pole right in front of us that are only about 20 feet away. Um, so I have been considering those, and I keep getting ads for them all the time on my social <laughs> media feeds. So I'm literally like, I am considering buying two of them and then at least having those two for when we really don't want a broadcast look that has like everything in focus, when we want more of that blurred background, then those will be much, much better for that. All right, last question. Comes to us from Danny Grizzle in Longview, Texas, and he says, you're in central Seattle. What kind of struggles do you have with radio frequency congestion? So we haven't had any um, struggle with that in the studio here. Um, we do a lot of shows downtown Seattle. We've gone to, we fly in to several different other cities. Like we've done shows in New York. Um, we've done shows in Los Angeles, like in, in those areas that have lots of frequencies flying around. Um, so we haven't had much trouble because the gear and the equipment that we have um, really, only our audio is, is what we're using, but that's the I believe it's the Shure QLX QLXD or the QLX digital series. It has an incredible like uh, frequency detection, and then if it detects a busy signal, it can switch frequencies. Um, and then you can also set it up so that it's a higher frequency that has a shorter throw of distance. So we haven't had much trouble with those, and we even fly around with those to busy locations and haven't really had any trouble with interference. Got to get the Axiants. That's next on the list. Is it? Sure, Axiants. Let, let me take a note of it. Colin, Chris, everyone, everyone at Tenacious, Tenacious, thank you so much for giving us some of your time this morning and giving us a peek into a truly a, a, an amazing, amazing studio. Uh, Guy, thank you so much for helping coordinate all this and being our office hours uh, man on the street. Uh, to, just to, I'm, I'm very jealous that you're going to, you know, the cameras are going to turn off and you're still going to be there. <laughs> um, thank you so much to our crew. I know we ran a little over today, but we were all kind of drooling at the eye candy in here. So, uh, but thank you to everyone who's hung on for a few extra minutes, cutting the show, making sure we look and sound good. Also, thank you to the panel for being here today, answering questions in the first hour, contributing to the second hour. Uh, we can't do the show without you. And the, no, not, not any one of us is as smart as all of us. So it's so nice to be here every day. And thank you to our great producers for asking all the questions uh, you've, you, you always amaze me at how much, uh, how much insight and how much different life experience everyone brings to those questions, and I get enriched every day. Uh, thank you very much for everyone on the Tlaloc Traversal today. We're 82,000 miles. That's 132,000 kilometers, which is 647 million bananas for scale. All right, thanks, everyone. We'll see you in after hours.
Nice show. Great show. Thank you. Everybody. Yeah, good Thanks, tour. everyone. That's fantastic. Very cool. Called Axiom like that. Accident. Uh... They're shopping already. I love it. <laughs> They're all... how, do you, how do you think you get us to feel like that? Sales. Can we get that on one day delivery? <laughs> <sighs> Amazon is up there. Again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, right now we're ordering a bunch of stuff. We're doing the, the Northwest Events Trade Show next week at the Seattle Convention Center. So we haven't done a ton of marketing or sales. So like this is kind of a new thing for me. So now I'm like, all right, I need to order tablecloths for these tables. <laughs> <laughs> the people who needed to know about you knew about you. That's what counts.